the Bible, possibly the most famous collection of books from antiquity. The Bible contains many mysterious stories about serpents, dragons, godmen, prophets, and wars. Dr. Bart D. Ehrman is an American New Testament scholar focusing on textual criticism of the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the origins and development of early Christianity. He has written and edited 30 books, including three college textbooks. He has also authored six New York Times bestsellers. He is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Today, he will be explaining this large collection of books and its influence on the world. Get ready to obtain true gnosis. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true gnosis. And I'm with the, the great Dr. Bart Ehrman, who uh, I love getting, to get on, getting back on the channel to ask him some questions about the course that's coming up, which is about Moses, finding Moses, and um, what scholars know about the Exodus in the Jewish law. This is a question that a lot of people probably want to know. So links in the description for that. Check that out. I'm going to be there. And also, you'll be helping me out as well. If you want to help support this channel, you'll help me out by using my link. With that being said, my first question is off the rip. What is your opinion on historical Moses? Is he based on any particular person? I hear people say uh, Akmosha, Tutmosha, all these different Moseses. That what, what's your opinion on? Is he based on any of these any of these people or no? No. <laughs> so he's not. Um... The, the the you know one of the questions I'll be dealing with in the course not the only question but you know was there Moses at all and you know what kind of evidence is there but the interesting thing about is the one that you're mentioning is that the name Moses uh, turns out not to be a Hebrew name it's in it's an Egyptian name and it does show up in the names of some pharaohs for example you know Tut Moses and things and so um, and so that's an interesting phenomenon because. Um, for all sorts of reasons. One being that if this was made up, if this was a story made up by Israelites, why didn't they give him a Hebrew name? <laughs> and so, we're, you know, where does the name come from? And and it, but I don't. But there's nothing to suggest that he was based on any other historical figure that we know about. Another thing that people like to um, to like to ask about or talk about is the Hyksos. And when we look at the Hyksos explosion, it's way before the so-called is israelite exodus do you think that this could be allegorizing this event or do you think they're not related at all um so the deal is is that egypt was a place that people uh immigrated to sometimes uh peoples did not just like individuals but there would be groups and the hyksos were a group of uh, a group of people uh, that 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 did uh come into egypt and actually uh Took over. I mean, the Hyksos, Hyksos actually ruled Egypt, and then were, uh, ended up being driven out. And it kind of sounds like in the Old Testament, you know, uh, Joseph goes down and he becomes this. Uh, he becomes second hand to Pharaoh, and he's the ruler. And then later, uh, generations later, his people are driven out. So it kind of sounds like that. And so um, I remember when I, when I was in graduate school back in the late '80s, the Hyksos uh, theory was a big big deal. Uh, that it wasn't used in order to say what you're saying what you're saying is maybe like they know about this hicksos thing and they're like modeling it in their own stories and that, that that's that's an interesting possibility but what the other what, what people were saying in my day where they were saying well so it's completely plausible that this happened uh because we have evidence of it happening with the hicksos and maybe actually this story is part of the hicksos invasion as you pointed out though the dates don't work very well um because the the when we date dating the exodus is a little bit tricky but um most scholars today uh, agree that it was sometime in the middle of the 13th century uh the bce so you know, like you know 1250 or whatever um and so that would be long after the hicksos were out of there yeah that's a good point and uh, another thing i want to ask you about is um people like to talk about how if there really was this giant exodus of people going through the desert I mean, if we go to the text it talks about they had these tents set up and the, the ark of the covenant is in the middle don't you think there'd be some sort of something left behind there'd be something to, to ask you this is there anything at all um well no <laughs> there's no archaeological evidence and that that has led to some disputes of course among scholars there are scholars not not just 
you know, fundamentalists and evangelicals, but there are, you know, historical scholars who think that there, that there is some historical basis uh, for the Exodus, and they have to deal with the fact that there really is no archaeological evidence for it. And some, some of them say, well, look, you know, we're, we're talking about stuff that was going on, like, uh, you know, this is the 21st century AD, CE, and that was the 13th century BC. So like how much stuff you expect to find in the sand, actually. But I remember when I was an evangelical Christian, we, we, we had heard all these rumors. Oh, my God, they found chariots in the bottom of the Red Sea. <laughs> I mean, <they're> not, true. <laughs> not true at all. Right, right. And the deal is, what your point is a really good one, because the book of Exodus itself and the book of Numbers indicate that the people who left, the Israelites who left Egypt, that there were 600,000 men of military age. So you're not talking about old men. You're not talking about children. You're not talking about women. 600,000. So you add all the others. What is that? Two and a half, three million people. And one problem is. That's more than the population of Egypt would have been <laughs> by a long shot. <laughs> and so, and, but apart from that, you know, three million people, you there, there's going to be there's going to be some kinds of remains like pottery or weaponry or uh, you know, I mean, there, 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 we have we have stuff from well, well before that for other civilization. There's nothing, <laughs> and so that's. Uh, that that does cause problems for think that there, that anything like what the Bible describes happened. It's a, it's a problem because you'd expect some remains. Yeah, and one of the things that shook my faith from hearing about this was that how the, the text tells you that they're starving and thirsty, and they're like all about to die, and then all of a sudden they're ready to go to war and fight against the whoever is the Midianites or whoever. Like who's, who's building the armor, the weapons, who's doing all this, who's feeding yeah. the army. Like that's, you got to think of the logistics of this. It doesn't even, it, it's impossible. Yeah. How do you, how do you, how do you smelt the swords? For example, I mean, how do you do that? And, uh, you know, so, uh, I know, and you know, but there are all sorts of weird things like that. I mean, like when, um, when when Pharaoh tries to chase, when he starts chasing them, they, Pharaoh has a change of heart after they leave, and and he decides to chase them, and he's chasing them, and the text says that he he gathered together his six hundred chariots, and the Israelites were afraid of this. Six hundred chariots. There are three million of these people. <laughs> there are six hundred thousand warriors. That's a thousand warriors for every chariot. Surely, surely a chariot. It's not like a machine gun, you know, where you can just mow them down. I mean, if you got you know, a thousand people to attack a chariot, <laughs> that doesn't seem to be a very fearsome prospect to me. <laughs> That's a good point. And I know that in the Old Testament, it just mentions Pharaoh, but doesn't say which Pharaoh it is. Does anybody have an idea if this is based yeah. on Ramses or anything else? Yeah, yeah. They there are. This is one of those areas that it seems like there could be some historical something behind it. Um, we're told that the um, the Israelites are uh, are forced to build the the city of Pi Ramses, and this city was built in the middle of the 13th century. And so. Um, what it suggests is that the um, the pharaoh at the Exodus was was Ramses II, and um, one problem with that is that in the Book of Exodus he leads his army against the Israelites, and he and his entire army get wiped out. But we know at Ramses, I mean, we have records of his rule after this event would have happened, and so there's no. So oh. that, that didn't really work. You can actually see his mummy if you go to if you go to Egypt. You, you, that's uh, a good point. And I and I think that that's that right there, what you just said, sort of defeats the Hyksos theory because that's 200, 300 years after the Hyksos. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's it. If it, if it's the mid-13th century and if it's if it's Ramses the second, then yeah, the Hyksos thing doesn't work. Right. The, the Hyksos thing would work as kind of an an, an analogous situation. And so you could, I think what people do is they imagine, we, we have records, we actually have records unconnected with the Bible of Semitic groups going down into Egypt. And we have one, one uh, letter, a letter that, was, that survives that talks about a Semitic group escaping from Egypt. And so I think what people who think that there's some kind of historical route here, and I, I'm not uncomfortable with that. I think that, you know, it makes sense or something behind it. But, but that you're talking about like a small group of people who got out of there 
And uh, later, as they started telling their stories, you know, <laughs> it's like when you tell your story about this guy, you just thrashed in a debate. Oh, I creamed him, man. Like he had nothing to say to me. You know, yeah. you actually listen to the debate. He had a lot to say to you. So you start exaggerating things when you win. <laughs> and you and so at, and then over centuries. Right. It turns out, you know, there are three million of them. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. Just like the New Testament, where where you got Jesus. Well, when he died, all the graves opened up, and there's dead people walking around. It's like, yeah, even the gospel writers are like, no, nah, I don't think that happened. But well, that's right. And, and there, you're dealing with you know a tradition maybe 50 years later. Imagine if you that tradition showed up, you know, 500 years later. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to ask you about this Moses raising up the serpent. It's um, it's from Levit. Or I'm sorry, is it from Leviticus? I think, and where he. I'm sorry, Numbers 21. I, just, I don't know why I have my notes all off. Numbers 21, he takes a bronze serpent in the wilderness, and he uh, he makes a fiery serpent, puts it on a standard. It says, if anyone is bitten, looks at it, he shall live. What's the, what, is, what does this even mean? Do you, do you, have, any, do you have any opinion on this? Um, number, the book of Numbers is very interesting. It's about what is happening to... Um, the children of Israel, as they, they've disobeyed God, and so they're going to be having to spend 40 years uh, in the wilderness. Uh, God wants the generation that left Egypt not to get the promised land, because so it has to be their children. So he has to wait 40 years. And so there's all sorts of events happening during these 40 years. And usually the way the events work is the children of Israel grumble. They, they don't like the food they're eating or there's not enough water. And they, they grumble against Moses and, and God punishes them. One of the, In one of these episodes, he punishes them by releasing these like these uh, serpents, <laughs> these deadly serpents that anybody they bite dies. And so Moses yeah. prays for the people and God says, okay, uh, the way to do it is to make it this kind of talisman. You make a make this pole and put a, a bronze serpent on it. Anybody who looks at it then um, won't be hurt by these snakes. That ends up being an important um, figure in the New Testament. The Gospel of John uses that to say that it's like Christ hanging on the cross. It's, right. it's the, the, certain, the one you look at for, for salvation. Yeah. yeah, it's like, how, how dare you starve and thirst? Now I'm going to kill you. And how three million people look on this serpent is a little bit hard to figure out. <laughs> wow. but, Good but sign. That, <laughs> Binoculars. <laughs> but I, I, I like where you're going with this, how they're borrowing this sort of theology in the New Testament. And there's another thing that I noticed in Leviticus where they have this sort of sin. It's, it's um, Yom Kippur ritual where they yeah. have one goat where they let, they let that goat free. And that's, that's Azazel, the scapegoat. And they have another goat that they slaughter in the temple, and he's the sin offering, I think with a bull as well. So I think there's three total animals. Do you think this is being allegorized in the New Testament where you have Jesus with two other, with, an, with Barabbas, and they let Barabbas go, but then they kill Jesus, and he's the sin offering? Do you think there's something going on there? A lot of people have thought so, and it's a little bit tricky. Because in the um, in the Christian tradition, um, Jesus' death, is, Jesus takes sin upon himself and dies, and that, and so he puts sin to death, and so he dies for your sins. The problem with the scapegoat thing, this is in Leviticus chapter sixteen, is that the the goat that is slaughtered is not the goat that takes the sin upon itself. The scapegoat, uh, the they put their hand so all the sins go onto the scapegoat and it runs off into the wilderness so it gets rid of the sins the other goat is killed as the sacrifice and so it's a little bit hard to work out the analogy uh with the new testament accounts of jesus death although there are you know there are a lot of people who think that there is something like that going on there now i thought jesus, about jesus, death, jesus death by the way is called an atonement and so right. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement, and his death is called an atonement. But how you work out with the goats is a well, problem. I, I've actually thought about this. Okay, good. <laughs> the Book of Hebrews. The Book of Hebrews talks about we our our uh, Jesus was killed outside of the temple, and I wonder if they're polemicizing the whole temple thing and saying that we don't you don't need the temple anymore. We're we're a, we're a, a, a universal. The world is the church now. Yeah. I think he actually says outside the gate, outside the walls of Jerusalem, which is okay. your point only kind of exaggerate a little bit because it yeah. means it's not it's not Jerusalem, the holy city where the temple is and the sacrifices are. Hebrew, the book of Hebrews makes a very big point that Jesus is superior to everything in the Jewish system. And so he's the perfect sacrifice 
And so you don't need these other sacrifices anymore. And so it could be play. It is certainly playing with the sacrificial image of the uh, the Old Testament in order to show the that Jesus is is the culmination. And so for for the book of Hebrews, the way I, I usually try to explain it is that Hebrews imagines that the Old Testament is like an architectural design for a building. Like you have an architect designs what the building can look like, then he builds the building. When you got the building, you don't need the design anymore. <laughs> and so Judaism is the design for what's going to be fulfilled with Jesus so you can get rid of the, the other thing now. Wow, that's a good point. I have, I think I have one more minute left. I want to ask you about when Moses meets with God. It's sort of, do you think there's an actual God standing there, like a, an anthropomorphic figure, a person, or do you think he's just, is this a vision? What do you think about this? So there are several incidents where Moses has an encounter with God, and they're narrated in different ways. The most impressive one is uh, in Exodus 20, right before he receives the, the Ten Commandments. And the way that one is portrayed is that God is not this anthropomorphic being. This is uh, what they call a theophany, an appearance of God, where there's like thunder and lightning and clouds and dark and like you're scared out of your wits. It's that kind of thing. <laughs> And so it isn't like God showing up. It's not like the Garden of Eden, you know, where God shows up to Adam and he walking through the garden. It's like he is like the transcendent almighty in, in, in that account. Um, but it does say that, you know, Moses, you know, that, I mean, he starts off actually in Exodus 3 where God, where it looks like the Lord is in this burning bush. And uh, and so you, you get so my point is you get these different kinds of things. And part of it is because you get different um, sources of tradition behind these books. And so you have different images of who God is and, and what it's like to encounter him. And welcome back to the Gnostic Informant. And you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm joined by the legend, Dr. Bart Ehrman, with his new upcoming course about the Gospel of Mark. The links are in the description for the course. I'm definitely going to be there, like always, like all the other courses, I'm always there, especially with Dr. Bart. Now, this is a subject that I'm really interested in, because when it comes to Mark, a lot of people don't know that Mark comes first, and that there's a lot of things in the following Gospels that they don't agree with. So my first question for you is, what are some of the things that Mark tells us about Jesus that the later Gospels try to fix? Ah, yeah, it's a good question, and thank you for introducing me as a legend. I'm I'm glad you didn't introduce me as a myth because I do exist. <laughs> um, yeah, Mark. You know, one of the points of my course uh, is going to be that you have to read Mark just for what it has to say. You can't. You can't think or assume or believe that it, you can believe, you can, but you shouldn't, that it's saying the same thing as Matthew or Luke or John. They all have their own distinctive message. And and Mark's is, is interesting in part because Matthew and Luke copied uh, Mark for part of their, for their source, for their stories and uh, changed, changed it in places, uh, sometimes uh, significantly. Uh, some, some of the changes would be kind of subtle corrections to Mark, and some are kind of explicit. But one, one of the things I'm, I'll be emphasizing in my, in my lectures is that the um, Gospel of Mark really wants to stress that during Jesus' lifetime, nobody could figure out who he was. Um, he, uh, he orders, when, when, when he is recognized, when the demons are being cast out and they call out and they say, you are the Holy One of God, he tells them to be silent. And he heals somebody and he'll say, don't tell anyone. <laughs> and then he'll, you know, he'll trans, he'll be transfigured in front of the, uh, three of his disciples. And he'll say, yeah, don't let anyone know about this. And so he's like keeping it a secret and nobody, nobody can figure it out. And so there's this, this business in Mark where he's trying to emphasize Jesus really was the Messiah. Uh, the Messiah really had to be crucified, contrary to what everybody thought. But nobody in his lifetime could figure that out. And man, you don't find that. <laughs> you don't find that, especially in John, for example. In John chapter one, people are saying, "Yeah, you're the Messiah," <laughs> and so uh, it's a, it's a very different a very different portrayal that way. That's interesting. Now, is there a difference in because when we talk we talk about this the earlier gospels and then Christ becoming more and more as God Himself as the time goes on. By the time you get to the Gospel of John, all of a sudden he's the he's the Logos who was there in the beginning, and he's created everything. Now, Mark's divinity. What are we? How far can we go? We can say he's the Son of God. We can say he's the Messiah. What about what about him being God Himself? What do you think about that? And just Mark. 
Yeah, it's you know you'd be you'd be hard pressed, I think, to show that uh, that Jesus is is actually God in some sense in Mark's gospel. Uh, he he's never called God. He's he is called the Son of God. Uh, the Son of God can mean a, a variety of things. In the Old Testament, the Son of God is usually understood to be some kind of being, an angel or a human being, who has been uh, assigned by God to a particular mission on earth. And so, for example, the uh, the King of Israel is called the Son of God in the Old Testament. And so being called the Son of God doesn't make somebody God. Right. Uh, but Jesus clearly has uh, enormous powers, <laughs> and he's um, he's he's been invested with authority that's not available to most people, to just about anybody in the Gospel of Mark. The authority to cast out demons, the authority to teach, the authority to heal, to to forgive sins, uh, and so he has this authority that's been given to him. Um, he's declared to be the Son of God when he's baptized. That's when God says, uh, "You're my Son, uh, in whom I'm well pleased." And so the question is, if Jesus is divine in some sense. In Mark, and the question is, in what sense, and what did Mark really think? My 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 view about this is you can't really get it from Mark. Mark himself doesn't tell you exactly what he's thinking, but um, it does appear. You know, we do know of Christians in the early church who thought that when a when a person was taken when when Jesus was taken up to heaven at the end, end of his life, that's when he actually became a divine being, that he was a very righteous human being who was taken up and made a divine being. Mark may have that idea. He may have the idea that at the baptism he became uh, the Son of God. It's 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 hard to know, but he's not God in the sense that he created the universe. And there's no there's no evidence there's no reference to him pre-existing his his uh, life. There's no uh, there's no virgin birth, uh, and so these things aren't there that they are in, in the other gospels. Interesting. It's almost like the when you when you think of that early Christian group known as the Arians who were you know, um, duking it out with the church over how to how to define his divinity. Maybe you're almost left to wonder if if Mark is one of the gospels they're looking at and saying well, he's not exactly the same as the Father. He's sort of separate in his own way. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, well, it's an interesting idea because certainly in Mark, Jesus is not equal with God the Father, and that is the, that is the later Arian view. Um, when the Arians came along. One of the difficulties that they and their opponents had is that they all agreed that all the Gospels agree on everything. <laughs> and so they, they weren't able to say, yeah, well, you know, Mark doesn't have that view because they, they all said, yeah, they all, you know, right before you get evangelical Christianity in the modern world, you had that it's kind of parallel in the ancient world where you, all these texts are God speaking to you. And so, uh, but the ideas in Mark, um, I think certainly did carry on. And there were there were Christian groups that continued to insist, um, not just like the Arians. I mean, the Arians, of course, thought Jesus was God in a sense, but it wasn't the full sense that, that you know, their Nicene, the Nicene Creed opposed. And so they didn't have that full sense that others had. Mark had, there were, there were people in early Christianity had more of Mark's view, which is that he was, Jesus was a very righteous human being who became the son of God. Um, and so, so Aaron's would be kind of a warmed up version of that, I guess. Now, when you look at the earliest mentions of what the Messiah is supposed to be like, as far as in like Jewish context, a lot of times Messiah is not the, the Messiah is a man chosen by God to usher in the kingdom of heaven and, you know, proclaim the, yeah, that, that, you know, God's coming, but the, the never, they never actually say that the Messiah is God or the son of God. What do you, how do you think Mark deals with this? Because Mark's coming up as one of these early Gospels. What do you, how do you think Mark deals with what the Messiah is supposed to be? I think it's the big task that Mark sets for himself. I think that is actually what he's trying to do, is trying to show how it is that Jesus could be uh, the Son of God, the Messiah. Um, and the, the reason, it, it, it's a reason that wouldn't make sense to most Christian uh, readers right off the bat, but it would make sense if you put Mark in his historical context where the term Messiah is a Jewish term and Jews meant something by it and they did not mean God. <laughs> and they absolutely did not mean somebody who gets tortured to death by his enemies. So it's not the, the so the Messiah in in the we know this from a, from Jewish writings from the time, including the Dead Sea Scrolls. We know what Jews 
who thought about it, the, the Jews who did think about a Messiah, probably most didn't, but those who did think about the Messiah had various kinds of ways of trying to understand it. Um, and the various ways had in common the idea that this was a powerful figure um, who would destroy God's enemies and establish Israel as a great kingdom and would rule that kingdom, a real kingdom here on earth. And so if many Jews thought he'd be like a, a, a son of David who would be like a political military leader who would drive out the Romans and then set up his throne in Jerusalem and have Israel as a sovereign state again, like under King David. And so they had these expectations, various ways of doing it, but all of them had that. This is a figure of grandeur and power who's going to wipe out the enemy. And everybody knew that Jesus was somebody who got crucified by the Romans for crimes against the state. And so Mark, Mark begins his gospel in a very simple but subtle way. His first verse is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, or the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah. And anybody reading that who's not already a Christian will be saying, what? <laughs> Jesus? <laughs> the, the crucified crew? You're going to tell me he's the Messiah? Yeah. Mark's whole gospel is trying to, design, to show that it's not that Jesus got crucified despite the fact he was the Messiah. Jesus got crucified because he was the Messiah. <laughs> And so Mark, Mark is trying to show that is what the Messiah is, uh, according to the will of God, as laid out in the scriptures. So that's interesting, because do you think it's safe to say that Mark is almost redefining what Messiah means? What I would say is that the author is not, but the Christians before him who told their stories were. I think that this I, it is absolutely a redefinition of the Messiah, and it was the major mission that the early Christians had. I think the early Christians were all Jews, and they knew you know they knew some scriptures and they knew the Jewish faith and they knew what the Messiah was supposed to be, but they believed Jesus was the Messiah. They had to redefine it. What does it mean? And I think they were driven to that right away. I don't think you know Mark is probably written about forty years after Jesus' death, yeah. and I think right after Jesus' death some of his followers started thinking like this because the second that they started saying Jesus was raised from the dead, they started thinking, well, you know, we thought he was the Messiah before he died and you know, that didn't work out too well, but God, God raised him for, oh my God, he really is the Messiah. How can he be the Messiah? <laughs> and so then they've got to figure out, well, you know, maybe we had the wrong idea. Maybe God's Messiah isn't going to be a great king. Maybe he's going to be something else. Maybe he's going to be a divine figure who's up in heaven, you know? And so, so they, you know, and so then they had to explain that for that to happen, he had to be crucified. And they, so they came up with the whole theology of Christianity. I think early, early, I don't think it was waited 40 years. Now, how much does Mark draw from the old Testament to paint the picture of Jesus? How much, does he do it quite often? Um, he's not as explicit as some of the other gospels. Uh, the gospel of Matthew, um, has 11 passages where he says that Jesus did something, you know, he's born in Bethlehem or he's born of a virgin to fulfill what was spoken of by the prophet, you know? And so he's, right. Mark, Matthew, 11 times is very explicit about it. Mark is usually more subtle than that, but he does, it is striking that after he begins by saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the very next thing he says is, as is spoken of in Isaiah, the prophet, <laughs> then he quotes, he quotes, he actually quotes Exodus, uh, Malachi and Isaiah to show that John the Baptist was the one that the that scripture had predicted would would be Jesus forerunner uh, and so it starts with a scripture fulfillment thing and Mark is just filled with the idea that all of this is going according to plan that this is what God had in mind all along why do you think Mark is coming at this with sort of a mystery feel like everything's so mysterious and secretive. What do you think the reason behind that is? Or do you think it's just, he's just being very creative with it? Well, it's a, um, it's one of the things that makes Mark a great piece of literature that everybody misses because they just read it so quickly thinking it's like the others, you know, it's like a short version, <laughs> the reader's digest version. Okay. I guess I'll read that. Yeah, so you don't really pay attention, but if you pay attention, you, you know, as we said earlier, you find all this stuff. And the question is why, why do you find this? Why do you find Jesus t keeping it secret? You know, in Mark chapter four, when Jesus tells his parables, Boy, this is one people don't see. I, I, I ask my students, I have my students read Mark chapter four, and I say, okay, why does Jesus tell parables? 
And they always say, well, he teaches in parables because he's trying to make a complicated lesson simple to understand. So he wants them to understand what he's saying. I said, okay, read verse 11 again. <laughs> you know? And so they read it. And it says that Jesus told parables so that nobody would understand. <clears throat> and so why does he do that? So the debate has gone back for over 100 years where scholars are trying to figure out what they call Mark's messianic secret. Why does he keep the Messiahship secret? Uh, and at the end, even the disciples never hear that Jesus was raised from the dead. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you, so there are lots of theories about it. But you know, one one view of it is that it's this it's it is a mystical thing. I mean, this is not what you'd expect. God works in strange ways, you know. And this is this is the latest strange way He's worked. Other people think that Mark is trying to show why it is that Christians today call Jesus the Messiah, even though during his lifetime, people weren't calling him the Messiah. Uh, Jesus was keeping it quiet. You know, he's keeping it a secret. That's why. So it's a it's an explanation of, of why, you know, why this happened after his death instead of before. And now do you think this might have something to do with giving the women or portraying the women as the ones who figured this out and the disciples didn't figure it out? And maybe the idea of him cursing the fig tree and the fig tree come, they come back later and the fig trees like, you know, shriveled up. Is this him? Is this the author of Mark saying that we're, we're turning this thing on its head. Now we're flipping the narrative and no longer is this going to be some sort of um, movement. That's just for people at the temple, but also it's for everybody for the world. Yeah, it's a, it's absolutely a flip of the narrative. And um, the cursing of the fig tree always puzzles people, but the fig tree in the Bible is often an image of Israel. And Jesus, it doesn't bear fruit. And so Jesus curses it and it, it withers up. Uh, that seems to be a prediction of the destruction of the coming, the coming destruction of Jerusalem. And the women are the ones who find, find out. They go to the empty tomb. Jesus is definitely raised from the dead in Mark's gospel. Um, and so uh, he's raised from the dead, and uh, but the women are the ones who find out, and they never tell anybody. <laughs> so Mark ends in a great note. The, the secrecy continues. All right. So Dr. Bart Ehrman, good to see you again, as always. And, uh, of course, I just mentioned in that um, segment before this about this, the class coming up, the course, and I, I want to get right into it. So my, my question is, the, we got these four main Gospels. I know there's also extra biblical sources but these four main gospels when were they what, what what are the dates that you think not like the what is your opinion on the dating of these four and then um how do they get named what they're named okay yeah big questions and so the um you know my my opinion on the gospel dates is basically the common view it's not something i came up with it's like it's what just about all historical scholars not all but I mean, most historical scholars think which is that mark was probably our first gospel written around the year 70 of the common era so if jesus died around the year 30 about 40 years after jesus death uh, matthew and luke were almost certainly later than mark and they're usually dated to the mid 80s or so 80, 85, something like that of the common era. John is usually thought to be the last gospel written around 90 to 95 uh, of the common era. And so these are books written about 40 to 65 years after, after Jesus' death. They're named uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We don't know who the actual authors were. The authors are uh, don't tell us their names. They're written anonymously. They're written in uh, Greek, in a high level Greek, for uh, which means that the authors were Greek speaking Christians of a later generation who were well educated, which suggests that they uh, were not written by Jesus' own followers, who were lower class, uneducated uh, peasants who spoke Aramaic. Interesting. And when is the first, when's the first reference of them being named, for example, when's the first time someone called Mark, Mark? Do we know? Yeah, yeah we do know. Yeah. Well, we know what the first on record, um, and, but it's complicated. This is a complicated question. I just did another course, by the way, that, that was called, um, uh, were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? <laughs> And people can see that on my on my website because I've got I've got this course. It's in and, right. and it's a very interesting very interesting issue. The first time somebody mentions uh, a Mark is uh, a church father named Papias, who is writing and maybe around the year one thirty or so. We're not quite sure one twenty one forty somewhere in there. Um, who says that Mark was the secretary of Peter and he wrote down everything that he heard Peter say about Jesus. 
Uh, and he says that Matthew wrote down an account of Jesus' sayings in, in Hebrew. Uh, and so he mentions Matthew and Mark doesn't mention Luke or John in our surviving accounts. And it's not clear. In fact, I, I rather doubt when he mentions Matthew, he doesn't seem to be talking about our Matthew because our Matthew isn't a, isn't a list of Jesus sayings and it wasn't written in Hebrew. <laughs> so uh, and I don't know if he's talking about our Mark or not. The first time we actually have anybody name these books, you know, call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and quote them so we know they're talking about our books is uh, in the writings of Irenaeus who was a church father writing around the year 180 or so, 180, 185. And so that's about 100 years after these books were in circulation that we first have somebody who not, not only quotes the books, but actually tells you who they thought wrote them. Interesting. Um, is there any, any chance that some of these, like maybe Luke X, for example, which is pretty long and tradition says that he wrote both of these books, is it possible this is a rolling text that it could have been, there could have been a like a original version and then, someone added something to it later on and then over the course of like a century is finally Luke X. Is that possibility or no? Yeah. Uh, several things to say about that. It's, it's a possibility scholars have certainly considered. Um, Luke and Acts is usually understood itself as being a two volume work um, that they almost, almost certainly with the same author. If you read the first few verses of Luke and then the first few verses of Acts, it's pretty clear. It's the same guy. And the, the, the literary style, the the hand the writing style the the themes the theology the beliefs it, like it's very consistent throughout Luke and Acts and so that's clear some people some scholars have thought that Luke went through a couple of different versions that there was an original version that was put in circulation and uh, that we later had some additions put onto it I personally think that that's right I, I'm not completely convinced of it but I think it's probably right that ori the original version of Luke probably started with what is now chapter three verse one and the original version of Luke did not have the birth narrative wow. the story of Jesus being born in Bethlehem to a virgin in Luke chapters one and two and some scholars have also thought that the book of Acts uh, went through a couple of different versions where the reason for thinking that's a little bit different we actually have different manuscripts of Acts that are significantly different from each other about seven and a half one one kind of it version is about seven and a half percent longer than the other one. And some people thought that Luke did two versions that got put in circulation. And so that's all possible, but it would not have taken a century. Uh, and it, it would not have been the kind of thing where what we have is a book by committee. Uh, it's really, it is almost entirely, both books are almost entirely by the same person. Uh, and whether uh, parts were added. It's possible he added them. Probable that he added, or maybe somebody else did. So I don't. I don't think we should think of these two books as books by committee, though. And for for people who doubt that, what, what would you say? Is it textual criticism that proves this? Well, we don't have any manuscripts that support the idea that it's, it's a book by committee, uh, and we. And the main reason for thinking that it's not a book by committee is the internal consistency. And so, for example, if if uh, if you if you write a suppose you write an essay and I come in and start a, and I add a page here and there, you're going to tell the difference just by the way I write. I mean, right. I write differently from the way you write. And so um, so so what scholars have done is they've analyzed the text very carefully in the Greek and they've looked for writing style. Uh, and on a very, very complicated level, including things, what kind of conjunctions does this person use? How does this person use subordinate clauses? How do, how do they use participles? Different people use these things differently without even thinking about it. And, but if you, so if you analyze a writing that way, you can see pretty well if it's, it's almost certainly the same author or possibly not. Now, I'm not an expert in Greek. I'm actually just starting to learn a little bit of it, but it seems like the narrative in Acts, for after chapter eight, I think it is, just goes from, you know, talking about how great Peter is, all of a sudden Paul is the main character. Do you think that might be some someone somewhat of a change in the style, or is this com completely yeah. consistent in your opinion? You do not see a difference in the Greek after that. Uh, you see a difference in the subject. And if you carefully read Luke and Acts and, and try to understand it as a, as a gestalt, as a, like a whole thing, a two-volume work, it makes perfect sense what happens. Paul converts in chapter 9. Um, so the first eight chapters are about the church in Jerusalem and what's going on there. But the point of Acts that's announced already in verse 8 of chapter 1 is that it's going to be about how the gospel goes from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Sure, sure. And Paul is the one who makes that happen. So he converts in chapter 9. And in chapters 10 and 11, Peter ends up 
having this supernatural vision that informs him that Paul's view is going to be right. <laughs> and then Paul starts on his missionary journeys and Paul carries out his missionary journey. And so there's, there's complete continuity. It, it's true that the subject changes, but it changes in part because Acts, it's different from the book of Luke. I mean, Luke is the life of the ministry of Jesus. That's it, right. just a year or two. Acts covers 30 years. Right. And so, uh, so it, it's necessarily going to have a change of topic. <clears throat> That's very interesting. The disconnect between what Paul is saying sometimes in these epistles and what's written in the Gospels, what do you think happened there? Do you think there's a, do you think there's just a different approach? Are they different in a different location? Are they disagreeing about certain things? <clears throat> yeah, no, it's a good point. It's not just Paul between the Gospels. It's the Gospels among themselves. They, they have different perspectives and, and yes. different ideas about who Jesus is and what he said. And, and, and Paul is a different thing. And I think what's going on is that um, you get different kinds of Christianity in different parts of the, uh, of the growing Christian community throughout the world. Kind of like today, you know, if you take, um, if, you, if you go to Moscow and look what Christianity is like there, it's very different from uh, what you're going to find uh, in in uh, someplace in uh, Georgia. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like it's, very, it's very different. And what you find in the Deep South is very different from what you find in the North uh, in the northeast in, in America. And so different places have different forms of Christianity. And in the early church, that's how it happened. But then they didn't have mass communication. And so these individual communities would start out and they would develop their own views, and their own ideas and things without having a lot of contact with everybody else. They can't just send emails back and forth to figure <laughs> out who do you think Jesus was? You know, they, they so so their, their views develop in different ways. And so Within the New Testament, you definitely have different authors with different points of view, and that's one of that's one of the things I'm going to be emphasizing in this course is that the four, the, the, what scholars know about these four gospels now is they have to be taken individually. You can't pretend they're all saying the same thing because if you do, you misunderstand what they're all saying. Yeah, that's a really good point. Now I want to now Mar since Mark is the first one and John's the last one, I just want to compare these two, but just just. I'm just picking two out of out of the box, not not for any reason in particular. What what would you say the difference is in the way they portray Jesus between Mark and John? Well, I would say there I would I you know there are lots and lots of differences. I would say that two of the really big ones are um, what did Jesus teach? Um, in in Mark's gospel, Jesus' entire message is that there's a kingdom of God that is coming. It's coming soon, and you need to prepare for it by repenting of your sins. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be destroyed. <laughs> and so you need to get ready for this coming kingdom. Jesus doesn't teach about who he is in Mark. Just says very, very little about who he is. And when he talks about himself, it's just that he's going to go to Jerusalem to die. That You know, he doesn't say anything about who he is personally. In the Gospel of John, all he talks about is who he is. He never talks about the kingdom of God coming and needing to repent in preparation for this coming kingdom. It's all about who his identity as one who's come from heaven to earth to reveal the truth of God so that people can have a heavenly birth. And, and it's all about Jesus' identity. So, well, that's rather big. Did Jesus call himself God? Well, in John, he's constantly talking about his divine identity. Right. In Mark, he never does. So that's, that's big. The other, second thing is, why does he do miracles? In, in Mark, he never does miracles to prove who he is. When they want him to do a miracle to prove who he is, he refuses. He won't do it. He does miracles to help people. In the Gospel of John, he does miracles to prove who he is. And John actually tells us that's why the miracles are done. He called, John calls them signs. They're to signify. They're signs of who Jesus actually is. Pretty big differences. And, you know, those aren't the only ones, obviously. Do you think that these... Gospels are reflecting a different type of Christianity, like a, a variety of Christianity in early on? Yes, I think that they are different varieties of Christianity. But I would say that because these four were chosen by church fathers to be the New Testament, that there are basic continuities among these four. If any of them was radically different, uh, you know, they wouldn't have included it. And so these do represent the four views that 
church leaders in the third, fourth, fifth centuries said, look, these are these are the definitive ones. And once they're put into a Bible, of course, they're all read as if they're saying the same thing. <laughs> That's a mistake. Uh, but it's also a mistake to say that, you know, they, that they are crazily different. You know, it's not like in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, well, there are 360 gods and uh, actually I'm from Mars. <laughs> you, know, he's like, you know, they are crazily different. Yeah. And the reason why I bring that up, I was talking to Dr. Mark Andrew about this. And um, and we're, if you go to like the Wikipedia page for Christianity, it's it's and this is a really common misconception about Christianity. It starts off the great church and then all of a sudden it branches off into heresies and different types yeah. of Christianity. But really, it's kind of the opposite, especially when you look at how these gospels are portraying Jesus. It seems like there's a big variety in the beginning and then yeah. it sort of swells, goes down into a church. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That was a breakthrough that happened in scholarship in the 1930s. Uh, a, a scholar named Walter Bauer in Germany came to realize that it's not like Christianity was one thing. You know, it started out as like the Council of Nicaea going back to the days of Jesus. And then you have these little offshoot heresies. It's that what you have is a wide variety to begin with that are fighting over which view is right. And they hammer out this kind of consensus view and get rid of a bunch of views. And that ends up being the Catholic Church. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant. And you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm with the man who needs no introduction. Everyone here, everyone watching my channel knows Dr. Bart. One of the greats of our time and these when we talk about these topics of biblical studies and ancient history mythology stuff and this is a topic that i really am really excited about i'm definitely going to be at this course you guys need to sign up for this course links in the description other virgin births in antiquity like this is such a hot topic for my channel because we you know we get into all these different comparative mythology stuff and so now we have Dr. Bart talking about this, and this is going to be on the course. So definitely check out the course. And without further ado, let me get into my first question. Before we even get into any of these other births, I want to ask you about the word virgin in the Old Testament and how it appears in the Hebrew versus the Greek, which becomes sort of a theme in the New Testament because obviously Jesus is born of a virgin. Is this a mistake? Is this on purpose? What is your thoughts on the Greek Septuagint versus the Hebrew Masoretic text for this Isaiah prophecy? So the passage is uh, it's in Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, and to understand what's going on in Isaiah, you have to know something about what's going on in, in the context of this verse. People, what people do is they rip it out of context and don't understand, which is what Matthew did. He took it out of its context. In the, in the context, uh, Isaiah is called in to uh, talk with the king of, of Israel because of Judea because the city Jerusalem is surrounded by enemies and he's worried he's going to be wiped out. And Isaiah is telling him that he's not going to be wiped out. God's going to deliver him from this and he's going to give him a sign. And the sign is that a young woman who is pregnant is going to have a child. And before the child is very old, very old at all, uh, these two kingdoms will disappear and will no longer be a threat. Uh, when Isaiah says that, he says that a uh, chapter 7, verse 14, a young woman is conceived and will bear a son and uh, you'll call his name. God is with us. Um, and so uh, the, the Hebrew word is Alma. Uh, the, the woman is called an Alma, which is a, just a word for a young woman. Um, it, it can mean virgin in the sense that many young women are virgins, <laughs> but the word doesn't mean virgin. It doesn't mean a woman who's never had sex. There's a different, there's a different Hebrew word for that, uh, Bethula, uh, and Isaiah doesn't say that. And Isaiah doesn't say she's going to become pregnant. She says, he says that she's already, so he's talking about somebody, a woman, maybe somebody standing there saying, look, this woman, you know, is pregnant before a child's very old. Um, when the Greek translators of the Old Testament translated the passage, they used a word that means can mean young woman, Parthenos, but it's also a word that could mean a woman who's never had sex. And uh, later it came to take on that meaning more strongly. Uh, when Matthew is writing his account of Jesus' birth, he's using the Greek translation and he uses Parthenos and he thinks that it means woman who's never had sex. And so in Matthew's version, then, this woman who's never had sex is the fulfillment of what Isaiah is predicting. Even though Isaiah doesn't talk about a woman who's never had sex and doesn't talk about a prediction of a woman who's going to give birth later, but somebody who's living in his own, own time. 
Wow. So in your in your in your honest opinion, do you think that do you think this is a big deal that Christianity sort of grows out of a uh, translation? I want I want to say mistake, but just a translation change. Yeah. Or do you think that this is not a big deal? Well, for thing for one thing, I don't think Christianity ever depended on the virgin birth story. Sure. There were Christians around. The, 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 of the twenty seven books in the New Testament, only two mentioned the virgin birth. And so all the other books have nothing to do with Paul doesn't seem to know about it. Mark doesn't say anything. The Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of John doesn't say anything about it. So, so these, these authors don't think that the virgin birth is a critical component of the Christian faith. And so I wouldn't say that Christianity grew out of a mistranslation. I would say that the doctrine of the virgin birth may have originated from this, this misunderstanding uh, mm. of Matthew. Or another option is that... Um, you get it. You get this. You get the virgin birth in Luke as well. The stories are completely different. It's it's almost it's, it's impossible to reconcile Matthew's account with Luke's account, but they both have a virgin birth. But in Luke, it's not to fulfill scripture. In Luke, the virgin birth shows that Jesus' father really is God. <laughs> in other words, he's literally the son of God. Uh, that's not Matthew's point, but that's Luke's point. And it could be that the, the story started that way. With somebody saying, look, Jesus really had God as his father, and then somebody came up with the virgin birth story. Interesting, because this gets into the next topic, which is other ancient people or gods, whatever, whether they're humans or, or gods, they, there's a lot of these stories of other miraculous or virgin births. Some of them are not as true as others. People say that Mithra was born of a virgin, even though there's no text of that. What are, what are some examples of texts that we do have? some prime examples of actual virgin births. Well, that's going to be the topic of my webinar. And uh, I'll tell you the question I'm going to deal with without giving you the answer. Sure. <laughs> the question is uh, closely related to what you're saying, which is that if you go, look, if you go on the internet or you just talk to people, not just mythicists, but I mean, just like, and, you know, and the, a lot of people will say, yeah, there are lots of virgin births in the ancient world. Uh, and they'll list them, you know, you give you the list of uh, Hercules, you know, and Romulus and Alexander Great and Plato. And so you get this list. And so what what is absolutely true that everybody has to concede is that there are there are stories back there in Greek and Roman mythology of a god getting a woman pregnant. Um, uh, and so. Uh, you know, you find a lot in Greek and Roman mythology, but you also find it with historical figures. I mean, Plato, the philosopher Plato, is Pythagoras, the philosopher Pythagoras, Alexander the Great. I mean, these are people who said that their, their, their parents actually were divine beings. And so um, there's no doubt that that happens uh, all over the place. My question is, uh, that I'll be dealing with them in the, in the webinar is, were any of these women virgins? In other words, were they virgin? <laughs> had they ever had sex before? Uh, were th and so uh, I think that's a more interesting question. Uh, I mean, it's very interesting that you have these accounts of divine beings um, getting mortal beings pregnant. That's that's really interesting and very very important. But it's also important and interesting to ask: Is any of them a virgin? And if if so, then are Christians just ripping it off from everybody else? And if not, then why are Christians coming up with this? You know, in other words, what what would be, what are they trying to emphasize that might be different from someone else? And so those are the kinds of issues I'll be dealing with. Wow, I can't wait for that. Let me ask you about Jesus historically and how is his, I mean, I know we don't have a lot of sources for this. I know a lot of this stuff might come later. It might come a century or two later. But how do people respond to this virgin birth? Are there anyone saying that, no, it, he really, really was out of adultery, stuff, something like that. Do we have any instances of something like that? Yeah, it turns out um, in, in Christian circles early on, there were some Christian groups who said that Jesus was not born of a virgin. Some Jewish Christians uh, famously thought that he was really, he, Joseph and Mary had sex and they had a baby, it's Jesus. And he just happened to grow up more righteous than anyone. And so God chose him to be his Messiah. There, there were Jewish Christian groups that said that. Uh, but they they ended up getting quashed by the end of the second century or so. I mean, not completely quashed, but um, so uh, there were non Christians who who were saying that Jesus did have an unusual birth, but it's because he's born out of wedlock. Um, and so you get these traditions that go back at least into the second century, 
that are in both Jewish and pagan circles that uh, that Jesus was an illegitimate child. Um, and there's a specific rumor that he that his mother Mary was raped by a Roman soldier, uh, who uh, sometimes named Panthera. Um, and so uh, you get this you get accounts of this in the second century, and so it it becomes a it becomes an issue throughout um, uh, throughout. I mean, people know about this. Some people know about this throughout history, down to uh, the life of Brian. <laughs> But in the life of Brian, there's like it's clear this this playing playing on this with Brian's own parentage. <laughs> so you do get people saying that yeah, there's just something else going on. And you know, one interesting question is if that's if if that's an older tradition, let's say that like you know, of the twenty of the twenty seven books in the New Testament, only two mention a virgin birth. In the other, in a couple of places, in both Mark and John, there's some suggestion that maybe there was something weird going on about his birth. Um, and so some people thought, well, maybe he was born illegitimately. And then somebody came up with the virgin birth story to explain the weirdness of his birth. Oh, no, it wasn't that, it, you know, they didn't know his father was. It's because God was his father, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, there may be one of the explanations for why you get a virgin birth story. Um, I'm, I'm, I know first, I know Celsus is one of the early mid second century authors who is hostile to Christianity. He mentions this about this yeah. uh, part or um, Yeshua Ben Pantera thing, and he yeah. says that his sources are from the Jews. Yeah, is this is this credible? Do, do people criticize? Is this is this a thing that scholars take seriously? Um, that he's born of a Roman soldier. <laughs> no, not not just that, but that the sources come from the Jews. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Now, if um. If, so if that's the case, do you think that the the uh, the evidence for this does is it? Do we have like sources that go back to first century? Is it second century? Or is it later? Uh, about this rumor about about, about, the, bird, about his father about the Pantera about, thing. About yeah. Pantera thing. The er, the earliest reference we get is in the second century. Um, Celsus is writing about the year one hundred and seventy. Uh, and he's basing yeah. this on earlier. So sometime in the mid second century, at least we know that this was a story that was, that was floating around. It is often thought that it is a, um, that there's a linguistic reason for this particular story. Panthera, uh, the, the alleged name of this Roman soldier is, uh, sounds similar to the word Parthenos, Panthera, Parthenos. And so they, uh, so Parthenos means virgin. Right. And so what's often thought is that uh, Christians say he's born of a Parthenos and that it's translated he's born to Panthera. And so um, that's possible. Let me just say for the record, the chance that Jesus coming out of Nazareth was, was uh, born of a woman who was raped by a Roman soldier is virtually nil. There, there were no soldiers posted in that part of the world. The Roman soldiers weren't playing. Everybody imagines Roman soldiers. They're all over Israel, you know, in the days of Jesus, like standing on every corner, making sure people don't do something wrong. They weren't. The, the Roman soldiers were stationed off in Syria. <laughs> they didn't have to be inside. They just had to protect against uh, invasion. And so Jesus himself probably never saw Roman soldiers in his entire life until he got crucified by some of them. And so, uh, so there's almost no chance that some girl in Nazareth got you know, ra raped by a Roman soldier. I think that's interesting because it, it's kind of like you pointed out the the two words Parthenos and Pantera very similar. And do you what's who's the first person to come along and say no 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 it's not Pantera you're just getting the the word Parthenos mixed up? Or um, do you, I I don't know the answer to that. I don't know uh, when that. Uh, I don't know when that linguistic connection is made. I don't really know. It's a great question. I should find out. I don't know. I don't know if it's in the ancient world or not. Yeah, that would be interesting to know. Uh, now, last thing I want to talk about is outside of Christianity in this virgin prophecy thing, is there a significance coming from other religions about a virgin giving birth? Some sort of, is this a, is this a thing that not just Christianity, but other religions are taking seriously for someone who's divine or, or somebody who's like, the chosen one or something like that? Um, other religions certainly have uh, emphases of uh, some people who are born of a, uh, of a divine being and a human being. Um, I mean, as an example, in, in the ancient world, Apollonius of Tiana uh, was understood. He's a philosopher. He's not particularly a religious leader, but he was understood that he could, um, 
that he was he, he was miraculously born, uh, that a god got his mother uh, pregnant and he could do miracles and heal the sick and cast out demons and raise the dead and ascended to heaven when he died. And so it's a very similar uh, story to Jesus. And so the idea that you could have a figure, and also in, in Greek and Roman mythology, some of the demigods, like uh, Heracles or Hercules uh, is kind of half God because his father is, is Zeus or Jupiter. So you certainly get that. And one of the questions on what I want, want to deal with in the, in the seminar is, are any of these virgin births and is the virgin birth tradition, the, not just as a God, not just, I mean, <laughs> a God getting a mortal pregnant would be a pretty big deal. <laughs> so I'm not just saying just, but I am saying is, is it, is it that the woman's a virgin? Does that have play any role in these other religions or not? Uh, and so that's, yeah, that's what, that's what I'll be talking about. Wow, that's decided. I can't wait for this course. I'm just going to real, real quick just run down some of the topics that are going to be in this course. One of the questions, what does it mean for someone to say someone was born of a virgin? Apart from Jesus, what else in the ancient world who is said literally to have a God for his father, but a mortal for his mother? And what do our sources say about miraculous famous births such as Hercules, Romulus, Alexander the Great, Apollonius and Tiana? And lastly, were their mothers virgins? And if so, what makes them different than Jesus? I love it. I can't wait for this course. Links in the description. Thank you again, Dr. Bart. And you have just attained true gnosis. Big question, the empty tomb. What are your thoughts on this? Is this a sort of constructed narrative or is there any truth to this? Is there any anything pointing to this? I have a high. I have a highly controversial view on this for scholars. It may not be controversial for your um, for your listeners. Um, I, for years and years and years, I thought that there must have been a, an empty tomb. That whatever, however, even when I was an atheist, I thought, you know, whatever, how, however, you might want to explain it, we just have overwhelming evidence that there's the tomb was empty. And now I don't think so. Um, I about ten years ago, I started looking into it. And what I what I looked into, I mean, you know, of course, our only stories about it are in the are in, in the Gospels. Um, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about Jesus not being in the tomb. Paul doesn't say anything about it. The others don't say anything about the tomb being empty. They do talk about Jesus being raised from the dead. They talk about people him appearing to people, but they don't talk about a tomb being empty. Right. And people are so used to the tomb being empty, they just assume it happened. So what I did is I looked up. So I was interested in what Romans did to crucified victims. When you crucify somebody, what happens to the body? And uh, I looked up every reference I could find in every Greek and Latin author from the ancient world about crucifixion. Wow. And most of them don't say anything about what happens to the remains. But when they do talk about the remains, what they always what they virtually always say is that the bodies were left on their crosses to uh, to decompose on the crosses so that the birds would eat them. Um, as part of the punishment. And the idea was that in the ancient world, peop people today, everybody today wants a decent burial today. Uh, but in the ancient world, this was a really, really big thing. You had to have a decent burial. And the Romans basically were flipping them the bird and saying, yeah, you're going to rot on the cross. And then, you know, and so when they, once they rotted on the cross for, you know, a couple of weeks, they <laughs> let them bury them or something. But, but so... I don't think Jesus could have been buried on the day he was crucified because Romans didn't do that. And there are only a couple of exceptions to that that are really highly exceptional. So I talk about this actually in my book, um, in my book, How Jesus Became God. I marshal the evidence and I try to show that, that Jesus almost certainly was not buried on that day. And so I think that there wasn't an empty tomb. I don't think anybody even knew about a tomb. I don't think there was a tomb. I think a couple weeks later, they threw him in a ditch or something. Like they do with most people. That's interesting. And do you think the Romans would have not let a Jew like Joseph Arimathea, for example, you don't think they would let him just come and hey, I'm going to take him down. Is it okay with you guys? <laughs> I'm laughing. We don't want to punish him, right? I mean, it's like saying, you know, like <laughs> you know, like <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Rome, I started laughing as I'm saying it because it sounds so ridiculous. Just people don't understand how there, but like, hey, I'm gonna take this guy down from the. Is it okay with you guys? Is it all right? I mean, Romans were, um, especially Roman administrators, had to had to work with a very iron fist, right? Because they they and Pilate was known for being completely ruthless. He didn't give a damn what 
the Jewish authorities. He, of course, didn't want to riot. Uh, and so he, he took care of things when things were getting out of hand. But that's it happened twice in his career. And it's when you have hundreds of people lining up in protest. It's not when this this Jesus that he's just crucified is a nobody. Nobody's heard of him. He's like this. He's he's come from Galilee. He doesn't even live in Jerusalem. Doesn't have any family there. Doesn't have any. It doesn't have. And so you know the idea that some guy went up to Pilate and said, "Oh, can, can I have the body?" Oh, sure, take him. No, it didn't work like it just didn't work like that. So I don't think there was an empty tomb. But I say that is controversial. Schol most scholars think I'm like really. Where do yeah. you think that legend comes from then? If if it's yeah yeah. No, that's that's the question then. Why do you have an empty tomb? The reason you have an empty tomb is because the early Christians believed that Jesus got physically raised from the dead. Um, they thought that because several of the early Christians uh, had visions of him. I mean, I think they really did have visions of him. I think, you know, people like, I think Peter, uh, probably, and Mary, probably, and later Paul and, and others, maybe others, at least those three, I think, almost certainly thought they saw Jesus alive afterwards. And in that day, if you're a Jew in that day, if you think you see somebody alive after they're dead, that means they got raised from the dead. Their, their body's been raised from the dead. The tomb was a story that developed over time to explain that he really was bodily raised from the dead. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I'm thinking about all the writers of the time period. You got Philo, you got Seneca, you got Plutarch later on, you got, and there's, I could probably list like 20 voluminous authors who were Pliny the Elder wrote an encyclopedia in that area. He wrote about the Essenes. He wrote about miracles. He wrote about prodigal births. And they don't seem to under, they, they see, it seems that they don't know who Jesus is yet. And my question, my question is, do you, is, is, is this such a small group of followers that is this, what, is this what's going on? It's just so small that no one knows who it is until later on. And it just slowly grows up. I think the problem is that people um, people think that, you know, they say, well, if the Gospels are right, you know, he's feeding 5,000 men at one time. That must, that's not kind of the women and children. There must be 13,000 people there. And there are crowds everywhere. You can't even get into a city. There's so many crowds. There's thousands, tens of thousands of people. And, if, you know, so since, Phil since Philo doesn't mention him or Pliny the Elder, well, that shows that he didn't exist. Oh, what? It shows that he didn't have all those followers. Right. That's a good <laughs> so, point. So you have to ask yourself, the, the high priest when Jesus was like a teenager, a very important, very the, the key figure in all of, uh, of Israel at the time was Annas, the father of Caiaphas. How many times is he mentioned by Philo or by Pliny the Elder or by, by Seneca or by Plutarch or... This is the most person person in that that entire country. How Ooh, often is he mentioned? He's never mentioned. Why would point. they mention him? So let alone some itinerant preacher from Galilee who's got you know he's got a small following, and ended up becoming the most important person in the history of the Western world. <laughs> right, right, right. But but he wasn't at the time, so it doesn't mean he didn't exist. It meant he wasn't he wasn't the the gospels have exaggerated his importance during his day it's impossible to exaggerate his importance now <laughs> yeah you have over two billion people who worship him <laughs> so like who else you got that going for him but but at the time no that's a really so that's good point I mean, you wouldn't ex you abs no historian would expect those people to mention him that's a really Historically. good point and, and another thing i like to and I, people don't under, people don't realize is paper papyrus parchment this was not cheap and easy to find. You had to find a scribe who can write, who's literate. Very rare. You also had to, sometimes you had to take animal skins and do some sort of really intense process to make paper. So like, this is not like some guy can be following Jesus around and pulls out a pencil on a paper and just starts writing stuff down. This is a process yeah. you need a, you need yeah. funding yeah. for. Yeah, but no, his disciples were not taking notes. <laughs> right, <laughs> and that's and, that, and I think that's really important to point out and when yeah. you talk about yeah. mythicism versus historicism. Uh, the Crestus character that's mentioned, I think, in Tacitus, I think, Suetonius. 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 He is is this the same person as Jesus, or is this a different? Because I hear that he might be a Roman slave, or something like that. What's yeah, that? it's hard to know. But Suetonius, Suetonius um, is writing about um, an action undertaken by Claudius, uh, who was a Roman emperor um, about 30 years after Jesus, 25 years after Jesus' death. And... Um, Claudius 
had uh, expelled the Jews from Rome because of some some uprisings of some kind. And he and Suetonius, who's writing 60 years later, 70 years later, says that Cla Claudius did this at, because these riots were these riots and the riots were instigated by Crestus. C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S. -E and um, for a long time, some people have thought a lot of people thought that this is a reference to Christ, Christos. Uh, it'd be a misspelling, but that Suetonius just probably didn't understand that he meant Christos. And the idea there is that. Um, that you had in Rome at the time, you had Christians who were following, who Jew, Jews who were following Jesus as the Messiah, Jews who were not following Jesus as the Messiah, and they're arguing it out, and it's leading to fighting in the streets. And so he kicked, he said, out of hell with all of you, he kicks them all out of Rome. That, that, that was the theory. And a lot of people still think that. A lot of Roman historians often think that. So, you know, it's not a religious thing. It's just Roman historians often think that. Other people think that Crestus is just the name of the person who started these riots, uh, and Crestus is a it's uh, it is a trib it is a name that is sometimes assigned to slaves uh, in the period, and so we don't know we don't know what the situation is we don't know whether it's riots over whether Jesus is the Messiah or if it's some Jewish slave or some other person named Crestus who for some reason is a controversial figure and it's led to some kind of riots. Don't really know. That's a good, good point. The last thing I want to touch on is the Josephus interpolation, because we, we he writes about brother of Jesus in one area of his of his writing, but he also writes about Jesus who was called the Christ. And my question is, how much of that do you think is interpolation? How much of that do you think was originally written by Josephus? So it's a debated issue, and of course, uh, mythicists want to throw the whole thing out, um, and Usually, you know, usually you have to like wonder what, I mean, you have to look at people's motives for wanting to do things because if, if Josephus mentions Jesus, that's kind of a problem. <laughs> it's not an insurmountable problem because you could still say he's made up. But but um, Josephus is a historian of the first century and he records a lot of events about a lot of people and uh, a number of people also named Jesus. I mean, Jesus was a common name. And so there are other people he talked about named Jesus. But there are two references to Jesus in the writings of Josephus in his book, The Antiquities. The Antiquities is a 20 volume work that uh, traces the history of the Jewish people from Adam and Eve <laughs> up, to, up to Josephus's day. That's a great history. It's like writing the, history, history. <laughs> the history of Americans starting with Adam and Eve. <laughs> uh, so, um, but he he has two two things he says about Jesus in chapter twenty the last the second reference is it's a story about somebody named James who is the brother of uh, of Jesus who is called the Messiah. Um, Josephus seems there to be referring back to somebody he's already referred to because he's telling you which Jesus it is, right. which of the Jesus which so Jesus is the one that's called the Messiah. In chap in book eighteen. He has a he actually has a paragraph that he devotes to Jesus, where he says that at this time there was a man, if you can call him a man named Jesus, and you know, he was the Messiah. <laughs> and then he goes on to talk about his teach his teaching, his followers, and that he um he got in trouble with the leaders of the Jewish people who handed him over to the Roman authorities, who then uh, executed him uh when Tiberius was the emperor. And so he he has this this paragraph that describes kind of the nuts and bolts that you would get, probably get from the gospels that Jesus was a teacher did amazing things and got crucified because, and so, so uh, it, it seems to confirm the basic, the very, very, very basic outline of what we know about Jesus historically and from, and from the early Christian sources. And the question is, um, did Josephus write that? And if he wrote it, did he write all of it or some of it, or how do we know? And so the, the, the widespread view, I think still widespread view, is that Josephus wrote most of that, but he certainly didn't write all of it. <laughs> because in this paragraph, he says Jesus was the Messiah, and he says that he was raised from the dead on the third day to fulfill the scriptures. <laughs> it's like he just writes the Nicene Creed just right there. Just exactly. Exactly. Yeah, he wants to write the Nicene Creed. It's like, so, but... You know, we know Josephus never became a follower of Jesus. He, we have his autobiography, so we know he never became a follower of Jesus. And so it looks like the, the deal is that Josephus was a, a, a persona non grata among Jews throughout most of history because he was thought to be a traitor to the Jewish cause during the Jewish war. Um, 
and um, and uh, for reasons I don't need to get into, but he tells it in his own writing. He tells right. him what he did. But he was a turncoat in their opinion. So Jews did not preserve his writings. Christians, his writings are preserved by Christian scribes. And the general thought is that what happened is Josephus wrote that section about Jesus, and he just says some basic things about him. Some people called him the Messiah. He 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 did weird things, <laughs> amazing deeds, and he, he said to have done amazing deeds. He he teach, he he taught, and they got in trouble with the law, and they crucified. Him. Hey, Doctor Ehrman, good to see you again. Hey, how you doing? Good. So let's just jump right into it. Um, I want to talk to you about the historical Jesus. The conversation between mythicists and historicists is still happening today. Richard Carrier wrote a, a pretty interesting book about Jesus not existing at all and just being a mythological character. However, I think the uh, kryptonite in, Carrier, in Carrier's uh, philosophy is the Nazareth. I think this is the strongest argument for historicists is that why would you want to make somebody from Nazareth, but he has to be from Bethlehem to be tied to David. And now they'll say to that, well, there's a quote from one of the gospels saying he should come from Nazareth. But the whole thing is just confusing. It doesn't make any sense to me. This is why I'm a historicist. However, I do want to know about the historical Jesus and what can we definitively know about him? If you take apart the mythology, for example, we know Herod didn't kill innocent babies. We know that he probably didn't get sold for 30 shekels, just like Joseph did. A lot of this stuff is drawn from the Old Testament. But if you take all that away, what are you left with? What do we know for sure about Jesus of Nazareth? Yeah, so I, um, you know, I, frankly, in, in scholarly circles, the conversation is not going on. It never has, really. I mean, it's not, so of, of the thousands of scholars I know who work on th these materials. I, I don't know anybody really talking about, <laughs> but, but, but I know that people on the internet are and that uh, people uh, find uh, Richard's uh, book uh, convincing and, uh, and other books. And so, you know, certainly needs to be, uh, needs to be addressed. Um, the um, sc scholars, scholars across the board um, who are actually you know, trained in this field. I mean, there, there just, it just isn't because the, the evidence is so overwhelming. It's not even, you know, it's, it's kind of like asking, you know, astronomers, is there still a conversation about whether the moon is made of cheese or not? You know, because <laughs> I just read that, I mean, you know, I've met, I've met people who said that the earth is hollow yeah, um, yeah. and um, who generally, I mean, you know, generally believe it, but there, this is not, it's not a discussion uh, among uh, physicists and astronomers and it's not a discussion because we know it's not hollow <laughs> we know it so so um so there's a difference between kind of what happens you know, like on the internet and popular audiences and what happens in, in scholars Absolutely. scholars whether they're atheist or christian or jew or whatever they are who study this stuff um are pretty unified not just that jesus existed but that you can say some things uh that pretty much definitely there's some things definitely just about everybody agrees with. And then there's a lot of things people disagree with. And a lot of it's for the reasons that you're pointing out that you, when it comes to the historical Jesus, and the mythicists are completely right in the, to the extent that there are things recorded about Jesus in the New Testament that did not happen. Um, that's absolutely, that's absolutely right. That doesn't mean he didn't exist. It just means that these things didn't happen. Just sure. like we have stories about George Washington that didn't happen. And I hear stories about me all the time that didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, it's like, so, Art, you know, don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I don't. <laughs> um, so, but, but there are certain things that just about everybody agrees on. They agree that Jesus was, they agree that he lived in the early part of the first century of the common era, that he grew up in Galilee, that he was Jewish, that he followed Jewish laws and Jewish customs, that he was some kind of Jewish teacher that he had followers, that he, um, uh, you know, so I mean, there, there's a list, there's a, those are kind of basic things. Yeah. There's, a, there's a long list of specifics that just about everybody agrees with. I mean, that, that he had brothers, uh, that mm -hmm. um, that he, he came from a poor place in, in Nazareth, that he was on a preaching, itinerant preaching ministry, that he preached about a, uh, they, he preached about uh, what he understood to be the true interpretation of the Torah, that he had disagreements with other Jewish teachers, that the last week of his life, he went to Jerusalem and that something happened there. He got arrested and that he was crucified. I mean, just about everybody who actually wants to look at the evidence without 
bias or just like, right. you know, you just want to look at the out. You just want to know. Yeah. And people like me, I mean, I, I really don't have a stake in this. My, uh, I, it, my life would be more interesting if Jesus was a myth because then I could, say, <laughs> boy, I could write all sorts of things. Just right. like more, my life would be more interesting if I'd become a born again Christian again. <laughs> yeah, right. You make a lot of money too. <laughs> so it's not rich that I, if you did that. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't. I don't. In, in that sense, I really don't have a stake in this. But you know. just you know, you look at the evidence. So those are things that the people would agree on. And those are all good points. And I just wanted to get that out the way because I also want to. Uh, look at other sources outside of the biblical text. So you got the Celsus and you got who, which the Talmud, I think is borrowing from Celsus saying that his father was a Roman soldier named Pantera. Is, is there anything to this? And it seems like the Jews took this pretty seriously. They put it in their Talmud. They said it was quoted by Elizier Ben Harkanis. So they're using the source that we know from Celsus, but they're also saying that Elizier Ben Harkanis said this as well in the first century. So I guess there's something to this. What do you think about this being? Is this is there anything to this, or is this just nonsense? Um, so we don't really know the circumstances of Jesus' uh, birth. Um, everything indicates that people thought it was unusual. <laughs> In the New Testament, he, you know, two of the Gospels say that he was born of a virgin, uh, and so that's unusual. Uh, uh, there are suggestions in Mark. And the in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John, that there were rumors that he was born out of wedlock. Uh, at least there, there's suggestions about that in the Gospel of John. There's suggestions in the Gospel of Mark that his mother, as an adult, didn't really understand what was going on with him. Uh, and so there are all sorts of interesting interesting things. Yeah. Uh, but what is usually thought that I think is almost certainly right is that there at least were stories about Jesus having an unusual birth. And it might, may have been that there were stories about him being born out of wedlock. Uh, and that, and some people have taken that as evidence that, in fact, that's what happened. That, that Mary, whoever Mary was, that she had gotten pregnant, and that Christians later, knowing about this, this birth, uh, said, well, actually, uh, yeah, but it's because she was born of a virgin. And he was born of a virgin. She was a virgin. So it's not that she had sex, but she wasn't, you know, so this is what happened. So that's, I think that's plausible, although I don't think there's a way to demonstrate one way or the other. Um, yeah. And a, another thing, I, I was talking to a rabbi about this and the dating in the Talmud, is it like in the first century BC, not first century AD? But he said the reason for that was because they were trying to sort of conceal that they were writing this stuff so that they wouldn't get killed by the church. Which oh, is no, 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 that's not right. Okay. That's not right. That's, that can't be right. People sure. who are constructing the Talmud were not worried about being killed by the Christians. Uh, and the Talmud, you know, the Talmud's in the fifth century. So, I mean, it's not going to be a reliable source of information for someone living 500 years earlier. But it does show that there was this Jewish idea floating around about Jesus. And you're right, the, the pagan critic Celsus also suggests this idea. Um, and there, so... The, the deal is that if he has this kind of strange birth and people think that he's born illegitimately, then people come up with the idea that his father was a Roman, uh, which is a which is an idea that, by the way, that is replicated in the life of Brian, the <laughs> Monty Python life of Brian, where Brian turns out his father was a Roman. That's so, so true. That's spoofing. That's spoofing on this idea about Jesus. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. But the, re but the logic of it is that th his father, Pantera, in this tradition, uh, was uh, the word Pantera sounds a lot like the word for virgin in uh, Greek. It, the word for virgin is parthenos, and this is penthera. And so it's out there. There's similar words. Mm -hmm. And so what people tend to think is the Christians were declaring that he's born of the parthenos and the opponents say he's born of penthera, <laughs> which meant and they said that was a Roman soldier. And so so it's I think it's I think that there is almost no way that the historical Jesus was born uh, that his father was a Roman soldier. And the reason I think there's no way that that can be true is because he almost certainly came from Nazareth. Nazareth was this little hamlet that nobody had ever heard of. There were not Romans in that area at all, let alone in a little hamlet. That we imagine them because we watch too many movies. That the Romans are every corner in the first century and the Jews are oppressed by these Romans who are everywhere. The Romans were not everywhere. They weren't even in Israel. They were, I mean, Pilate kept a group, a small group of soldiers on the seacoast in Caesarea uh, for his protection and things. But the, the armies were in Syria. And so 
there were not Roman soldiers floating around Galilee. <laughs> and so the idea that and if she was from Nazareth, she almost certainly never would have left Nazareth. And these, these are dirt poor people who never travel in this time. And so um, I don't think there's any way his father was a Roman soldier. <laughs> I think that's just a later legend. Sure. And because in another thing, even if that was true, then how I, I think it's completely ridiculous to say that there was two Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth that were that were hung on Passover for leading Israel astray. Well, well, what, 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 your, what your Talmudic friend would say is that they were actually talking about our Jesus, but they were doing it in code. Right. And so he's not saying there were two different ones. He's saying there's one, but that they're doing it in code. The code right. thing, it just doesn't work for the Talmud. Well, that's what I'm saying. Some, sometimes you hear people say, well, that's a different Jesus. Well, it, yeah. yeah. It, no, it, I know. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. Exactly. Including right. some witnesses, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> and, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> that's evidence. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so then you get to the the whole aspect of his father Joseph, and I just recently found this out recently because I I was I wasn't really up to speed on the cr chronology of the text. So you got Paul's letters, and then you got Mark. I think is the first gospel. Yeah. Well, in all of those writings, there's no mention of Joseph until you get to Luke and Matthew, which are the gospels that have the genealogy in them. So you get so you'll have people come up and say they're using their they're inventing this Joseph character to give De uh, Jesus a Davidic bloodline because both of the genealogies have Joseph and the genealogy being related to David. Uh, do you, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think Joseph was, do you, is a reason why he wasn't mentioned in any of Paul's epistles? No. So I don't, I'm not sure Paul knew anything about Jesus birth. The only thing he says about his birth is that, that Christ was born of a woman. <laughs> Galatians 4 4. Not particularly helpful datum. Right. <laughs> he born of a woman. So, right. but that's all he says. So, we don't know if he knows about a virgin birth or anything about his parents or anything like that. We don't know. Uh, and it may, my sense is that Paul was not going around trying to find out information about the historical Jesus because he just wasn't interested in that for weird reasons. It's another discussion. Um, Mark does not mention um, Joseph. He doesn't, um, but uh, it, there are suggestions in Mark that that if Mark did know about Jesus' father, that Jesus' father was dead at this time, by, and when Jesus was an adult. Uh, that would be typical because in, in the world at that time, most girls, they were girls, got married when they hit puberty, so around 13 or so, and the men tended to be much older. And so when, when a child had grown up, most men were dead. <laughs> and so, um, so that's probably the case there. Was his name really Joseph? Uh, I think probably so. I don't know why somebody would make it up. Ma Matthew and Luke both have the name Joseph, and throughout the tradition, wherever he's named, he's called Joseph. So he's probably Joseph. There's nothing significant about it. It's just his name. I don't think he was invented in order to give Jesus a Davidic lineage, because I don't think whoever this was, whoever his father was, I assume it's somebody named Joseph, would have had any idea what his lineage was. Um, I mean. People today sent, tend to think that Jews had like Ancestor.com or something where they, got, <laughs> they could just look it up and find out, you know, they didn't keep records. <laughs> they couldn't even read. <laughs> and so they, they, there are no records. And so whoever, so Matthew and Luke both do give a genealogy of tracing Joseph back to, uh, to King David and to, to Abraham. Um, but these genealogies differ from each other so that they're not getting from the same source and you don't need somebody named joseph to have the genealogy you just call him something else it doesn't matter what you call him as long as you got the genealogy going back to david i don't think the genealogies can be at all accurate but um but you know that's not why joseph was invented and i'm pretty sure that if he was a lineage he had a lineage going back to david i don't think he'd be poor in nazareth i think he'd probably be people if he if they, i'm saying if they knew this not like Oh, oh, no, no, that's a good point. But I think actually it's it's a good point because it's getting to something that I think is right, which is that people are wondering how could somebody from that, like this little Hamlet who must have grown up in abject poverty, how how could he be the king of the Jews? Right. And and so and so that's why you have to have this link to David, that he's actually sure. David's descendant, uh, because otherwise it doesn't really make sense that God's great Messiah is born in Nazareth. <laughs> Interesting. So do we do we have any physical evidence or any primary sources going to the life during the time of his life of Jesus? No. Or, no. OK, I, that's, that's my know, we, don't, we don't for I suppose we don't have for anybody in that period, except for um, um, 
Well, the, the high priest Caiaphas, the only thing we have, you know, so he's like the head, he's the, he's like the most important. He's like the, uh, you know, he's the president of the U.S. I mean, he's like the guy. Yeah. Um, we didn't have anything uh, from uh, from or about him until a few years ago. They found a bone box, an ossuary that had his name, his name inscribed on it. Oh, it wasn't wow. inscribed, it was scratched on there. And so for hundreds and hundreds of years, the most important person in Jesus at Jesus time <laughs> in, in his day we just that's all we got so you wouldn't expect anything for anybody really because of the nature of our surviving sources we just don't have information like that okay so and now the big question the empty tomb what are your thoughts on this is this a um, sort of constructed narrative or is there any truth to this is there any anything pointing to this i have a high i have a highly controversial view on this for scholars it may not be controversial for your um for your listeners um I, for years and years and years, I thought that there must have been a, an empty tomb, that whatever, however, even when I was an atheist, I thought, you know, whatever, how, however you might want to explain it, we just have overwhelming evidence that there's, the tomb was empty. And now I don't think so. Um, I, about 10 years ago, I started looking into it. And what I, what I looked into, I mean, you know, of course, our only stories about it are in the, are in, in the Gospels. Um, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about Jesus not being in the tomb. Paul doesn't say anything about it. The others don't say anything about the tomb being empty. They do talk about Jesus being raised from the dead. They talk about people, him appearing to people, but they don't talk about a tomb being empty. Right. And people are so used to the tomb being empty, they just assume it happened. So what I did is I looked up. So I was interested in what Romans did to crucified victims. Hmm. When you crucify somebody, what happens to the body? And uh, I looked up every reference I could find in every Greek and Latin author from the ancient world about crucifixion. Wow. And most of them don't say anything about what happens to the remains. But when they do talk about the remains, what they always what they virtually always say is that the bodies were left on their crosses to uh, to decompose on the crosses so that the birds would eat them um, as part of the punishment. And the idea was that in the ancient world, pe people today, everybody today wants a decent burial today. Uh, but in the ancient world, this was a really, really big thing. You had to have a decent burial. And the Romans basically were flipping them the bird and saying, yeah, you're going to rot on the cross. And then, you know, and so when they once they rotted on the cross for, you know, a couple of weeks, they <laughs> let them bury them or something. But but so I don't think Jesus could have been buried on the day he was crucified because Romans didn't do that. And there are only a couple of exceptions to that that are really highly exceptional. So I talk about this actually in my book, um, in my book, How Jesus Became God. I marshal the evidence and I try to show that that Jesus almost certainly was not buried on that day. And so I think that there wasn't an empty tomb. I don't think anybody even knew about a tomb. I don't think there was a tomb. I think a couple weeks later, they threw him in a ditch or something like they do with most people. That's interesting. And you think the Romans would have not let a Jew like Joseph of Arimathea, for example, you don't think they would let him just come and, hey, I'm going to take him down. Is it okay with you guys? <laughs> I'm laughing. We don't want to punish him. Right. I mean, it's like saying, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Rome, I started laughing as I'm saying it because it sounds so ridiculous. Just people don't understand just walk how in there and be like, hey, I'm going to take this guy down from the – is it okay with you guys? Is it all right? I mean, Romans were um, – especially Roman administrators had to had to work with a very iron fist. Right. Because they, they – and Pilate was known for being completely ruthless. He didn't give a damn what the Jewish authorities – he, of course, didn't want to riot. Uh, and so he, he took care of things when things were getting out of hand. But that's it happened twice in his career. And it's when you have hundreds of people lining up in protest. It's not when this this Jesus that he's just crucified is a nobody. Nobody's heard of him. He's like this. He's he's come from Galilee. He doesn't even live in Jerusalem. Doesn't have any family there. Doesn't have any. It doesn't have. And so, you know, the idea that some guy went up to Pilate and said, oh, can, can I have the body? For, oh, sure. Take him. No, it didn't work like it just didn't work like that. So I don't think there was an empty tomb. But I say that is controversial. Schol most scholars think I'm like, really? Where yeah. do you think that legend comes from then? If if it's yeah, yeah. No, that's that's the question then. Why do you have an empty tomb? The reason you have an empty tomb is because the early Christians believed that Jesus got physically raised from the dead. Um 
they thought that because several of the early Christians uh, had visions of him. I mean, I think they really did have visions of him. I think, you know, people like, I think Peter uh, probably and Mary probably and later Paul and, and others, maybe others, at least those three, I think almost certainly thought they saw Jesus alive afterwards. And in that day, if you're a Jew in that day, if you think you see somebody alive after they're dead, that means they got raised from the dead. Their, their body's been raised from the dead. The tomb was a story that developed over time to explain they really was bodily raised from the dead. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I'm thinking about all the writers of the time period. You got Philo, you got Seneca, you got Plutarch later on, you got, and there's, I could probably list like 20 voluminous authors who were Pliny the Elder wrote an encyclopedia in that area he wrote about the Essenes he wrote about miracles he wrote about prodigal births and they don't seem to under they, they see, it seems that they don't know who Jesus is yet and my question my question is do you is, is is this such a small group of followers that is this what is this what's going on it's just so small that no one knows who it is until later on and it just slowly grows up I think the problem is that people um people think that you know they say, well, if the Gospels are right, you know, he's feeding 5,000 men at one time. That must, that's not kind of the women and children. There must be 13,000 people there. And there are crowds everywhere. You can't even get into a city. There's so many crowds. There's thousands, tens of thousands of people. And, if, you know, so since, Phy since Philo doesn't mention him or Pliny the Elder, well, that shows that he didn't exist. <laughs> oh, what? It shows he didn't have all those followers. <laughs> right. That's a good so, point. So you have to ask yourself, the the high priest when jesus was like a teenager a very important very the, the key figure in all of uh of israel at the time was annas the father of caiaphas how many times is he mentioned by philo or by Pliny the elder or by by seneca or by plutarch or this is the most person person in that that entire country how often is he met he's never mentioned why would they mention him so let alone some itinerant preacher from Galilee who's got, you know, who's got a small following and ended up becoming the most important person in the history of the Western world. <laughs> right, right, right. But but he wasn't at the time. So it doesn't mean he didn't exist. It meant he wasn't he wasn't the the gospels have exaggerated his importance during his day. It's impossible to exaggerate his importance now. <laughs> you have yeah. over two billion people who worship him. <laughs> so, like, who else you got that going for him? But, but at the time, no. That's a really so that's good point. I mean, you wouldn't. You abs. No historian would expect those people to mention him. That's a really good point. And and another thing I like to and I, people don't people don't realize is paper, papyrus, parchment. This was not cheap and easy to find. You had to find a scribe who can write. Who's literate. Very rare. You also had to. Sometimes you had to take animal skins and do some sort of really intense process to make paper. So like, this is not like some guy can be following Jesus around and pulls out a pencil on a paper and just starts writing stuff down. This is the process yeah. you need a, you need yeah. funding yeah. for. Yeah. But no, his disciples were not taking notes. <laughs> right. Important. And that's good. And, that, and I think that's really important to point out. And when yeah. you talk about yeah. mythicism versus historicism, uh, the crust is character that's mentioned, I think in Tacitus, I think Suetonius. 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 Is is this the same person as Jesus, or is this a different? Because I hear that he might be a Roman slave, or something like that. What's yeah, the, it's Jesus? hard to know. But Suetonius, Suetonius um, is writing about um, an action undertaken by Claudius, uh, who was a Roman emperor um, about thirty years after Jesus, twenty five years after Jesus' death, and um, Claudius had uh, expelled the Jews from rome because of some some uprisings of some kind and he and suetonius who's writing 60 years later 70 years later says that Cla claudius did this at, because these riots were these riots and the riots were instigated by crestus c-h-r-e-s-t-u-s -E and um for a long time some people thought a lot of people thought that this is a reference to christ christos uh it'd be a misspelling but that suetonius just I didn't understand that he meant Christos. And the idea there is that um, that you had in Rome at the time, you had Christians who were following, who Jew, Jews who were following Jesus as the Messiah, Jews who were not following Jesus as the Messiah, and they're arguing it out and it's leading to fighting in the streets. And so he, kicked, he said, out of hell with all of you, he kicks them all out of Rome. 
that, that, that was the theory. And a lot of people still think that. A lot of Roman historians often think that. So, you know, it's not a religious thing. It's just Roman historians often think that. Other people think that Crestus is just the name of the person who started these riots. Uh, and Crestus is a, it's, uh, it, is a tri it is a name that is sometimes assigned to slaves uh, in the period. And so we don't know we don't know what the situation is. We don't know whether it's riots over whether Jesus is the Messiah or if it's some Jewish slave or some other person named Crestus who for some reason is a controversial figure and that's led to some kind of riots. Don't really know. That's a good good point. The last thing I want to touch on is the Josephus interpolation because we, we he writes about brother of Jesus in one area of his of his writing. But he also writes about Jesus, who was called the Christ. And my question is, how much of that do you think is interpolation? How much of that do you think was originally written by Josephus? So it's a debated issue. And of course, a mythos is want to throw the whole thing out. Um, and usually, you know, usually you have to like wonder what, I mean, you have to look at people's motives for wanting to do things. Because if, if Josephus mentions Jesus, that's kind of a problem. <laughs> it's not an insurmountable problem because you could still say he's made up. But but um, Josephus is a historian of the first century, and he records a lot of events about a lot of people. And uh, a number of people also named Jesus. I mean, Jesus was a common name. And so there are other people he talked about named Jesus. But there are two references to Jesus in the writings of Josephus in his book, The Antiquities. The Antiquities is a 20-volume work that uh, traces the history of the Jewish people from Adam and Eve <laughs> up, to, up to Josephus' day. That's a great history. It's like writing the, great history. History, <laughs> the history of Americans starting with Adam and Eve. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> uh, so, um, but he, he has two, two things he says about Jesus. In chapter 20, the, last, the second reference is, it's a story about somebody named James, who is the brother of, uh, of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Um, Josephus seems there to be referring back to somebody he's already referred to because he's telling you which Jesus it is, right. which is the Jesus, which is so the Jesus, the one that's called the Messiah. In chat in book eighteen, he has a he actually has a paragraph that he devotes to Jesus, where he says that at this time there was a man, if you can call him a man named Jesus, and you know he was the Messiah. <laughs> and then he goes on to talk about his teach, his teaching, his followers, and that he. Um, he got in trouble with the leaders of the Jewish people who handed him over to the Roman authorities who then uh, executed him uh, when Tiberius was the emperor. And so he, he has this, this paragraph that describes kind of the nuts and bolts that you would get, probably get from the Gospels. That Jesus was a teacher, did amazing things and got crucified because. And so so uh, it, it seems to confirm the basic, the very, very, very basic outline of what we know about Jesus historically and from and from the early Christian sources. And the question is, um, did Josephus write that? And if he wrote it, did he write all of it or some of it? Or how do we know? And so the the, the widespread view, I think still widespread view, is that Josephus wrote most of that, but he certainly didn't write all of it. <laughs> because in this paragraph, he says Jesus was the Messiah, and he says that he was raised from the dead on the third day to fulfill the scriptures. <laughs> it's like he just writes the Nicene Creed just right there. Just exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He also wrote the Nicene Creed. It's like, so, but, you know, we know Josephus never became a follower of Jesus. He, we have his autobiography, so we know he never became a follower of Jesus. And so it looks like the, the deal is that Josephus was a, a, a persona non grata among Jews throughout most of history because he was thought to be a traitor to the Jewish cause during the Jewish war. Um, and um, and uh, for reasons I don't need to get into, but he tells it in his own writing. He said that's right. what he did. But he was a turncoat in their opinion. So Jews did not preserve his writings. Christians, his writings are preserved by Christian scribes. And the general thought is that what happened is Josephus wrote that section about Jesus and he just says some basic things about him. Some people called him the Messiah. He, he, he did weird things, <laughs> amazing deeds. And he, he said to have done amazing deeds. He, he teach, he, he taught and they got in trouble with the law and they crucified. Him. And so, um, but then the scribe who's copying this wants to make sure you understand who this is. Right. Jesus called the, he was the Messiah, you know, and that he, <laughs> uh, and that he was raised from the dead and according to the the scripture, you know, so he adds a couple lines as scribes do. Right. Uh, and that, and that would explain why you have that reference in chapter 20 to Jesus, the one who's called the Messiah. In other words, the guy I just was talking about a couple of books ago. 
Uh, yeah. So that, that's my view is that, that Josephus probably did say something about that. And, um, but not, not everything that's there now. In fact, if it, if it wasn't for the other verse about going back to the book 18 about James, if that wasn't there, then I think they'd have a stronger case. But the fact that they're both there and they're connected sort yeah. of makes it seem like you can't really interplay both. And another thing I'm going to, I'm going to say this, and this is going to bother a lot of mythicists, but this is true. A lot of mythicists will say that verse looks like it's inserted in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't belong where it belongs. But if you actually look at book 18, it opens up about Pilate. So where else would you hear about Jesus other than right next to Pilate, the guy who kills him? It kind of does fit. I'm not going to lie. I I would say it does fit where it does. I, I mean, you hear the, 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 the story being told right before it gets into it. There is a man named Jesus, a wise man. It's about Pilate bringing statues into Jerusalem and then the Jews rebelling and saying, we don't want these statues, kill us all. And he's like, okay, fine, I won't bring them. And then it gets into, there was a wise man named Jesus. If you're Josephus writing this, you're thinking about Pilate and the things he was doing in Jerusalem. Obviously, you're going to think about, oh yeah, by the way, there was that guy, Jesus, that we killed. It made a big deal. It made a big stink about this one. Of course, you're going to put that there. So I think it does fit. I don't know what you think about that. It's yeah, like, yeah, I think, I think I don't th I don't think the idea that it just looks like it's been thrown in. I don't think that's right. I agree with that. The other thing is that if you think a Christian that uh, it's an interpolation, it's really hard to explain that thing in book twenty. Why didn't they Why didn't they go for it? Why didn't Why whoever's interpreting? Why didn't they say uh, this the brother of Jesus, the Messiah? You know, and then have a, another. Why not say something about him? instead of just an elusive thing. It's elusive as if an author is just referring back to something. It's not like an interpolation where they could have said, you know, uh, oh yeah, James, he's the brother of the Messiah, the son of God, who, uh, you know, who's worshiping and adored, but, you know, they would have said something. So, yeah. And this has been great. And just, if you want to give my audience any direction on where to go to find some more of your stuff and your, your, uh, yeah. your seminars. So a couple things. One is that I've started doing courses that uh, people can uh, purchase online that deal with, all sorts of things. Uh, and if they just go to barterman.com slash courses, they can see the ones I've done already and that I'm going to be doing. And anyone who's interested in the stuff, I deal with this kind of material all the time on my blog. Uh, so the Bart Ehrman blog, I post five times a week. I've been doing it, this is my 10th year. I've done it for every week, for 10 years. <laughs> and so, uh, and I answer questions. I answer every question I get. I deal with comments and so, uh, it's a really, I, I use it to raise money for charity. There's a small membership fee and it all, all the money goes to, to, to important charities. And welcome back to the Gnostic informant and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I am excited to bring you the next course from Dr. Bart Ehrman. And this is about the, t the, the topic of left behind, which is uh, a phrase a lot of evangelicals throw around. There's a movie made about it. It's about the rapture, it's about the book of Revelation and the rapture. And is the rapture a real thing from Revelation? Is it interpreted correctly? I have a lot of questions I want to ask about that. So um, without further ado, let's start off with the rapture. And where does this idea come from? And is it from the text or is it from somewhere else? Uh, yeah, well, the term rapture never occurs in the book of Revelation. And to everybody's great surprise, the concept is never found in the book of Revelation. <laughs> uh, the rapture is the uh, the doctrine that you find in fundamentalist and some conservative evangelical circles, that Jesus is coming back uh, from heaven to take his followers out of the world uh, before a seven-year period of tribulation, horrible suffering, here on earth, but the followers of Jesus will not have to experience it because they'll be taken out. And that's called the rapture. That is a doctrine that even though many um, millions and millions of Christians believe it, and they just assume it's in the Bible, but it's not. It's the first time somebody came up with the idea of this rapture before the tribulation on earth was uh, in the 18, 1830s. <laughs> so throughout throughout all of Christian history, nobody even thought of this one <laughs> until modern times. Wow, because you have, there's the story, and well, it's, this is actual history, but there's, there's, there's the story about in the year 1000, Pope Sylvester II was ba based off the book of Revelation, where it talks about the Satan being chained for a thousand years. And after the thousand year reign is over, he's going to come back. And so you're t you mean to tell me that during this time, people weren't waiting for a rapture. 
they're waiting for something else, some sort of war breakout. Um, the book of Revelation does say that Jesus is coming back, and this is a view that Paul has as well. It's a New Testament view. When Jesus comes back, he's coming to destroy his enemies. Uh, he's not coming back to take Christians out of the world. Uh, and so you get this. Even in the New Testament, people turn to certain passages that appear to, be, that appear to them uh, to be references to the rapture. These were, you know, when I was an evangelical Christian, we just believed that that's what these passages were saying. The most famous is in First Thessalonians chapter four, verses thirteen to eighteen, which says that uh, when Christ returns, the the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive, who are left at the time, says Paul, seems to be including himself among those who will be alive. When we who are left are alive, will be taken up with them to meet meet the Lord in the air. And it, wow, okay, that's the rapture, right? Yeah, it, it sounds like that when you take it out of its context. But um, what people fail to notice is that right after he says this, he continues with the same thought. And it's a little bit hard in English Bibles because in English Bibles, chapter five is separated from chapter four. And so you think he's done talking now. But when Paul wrote, he didn't have chapters. <laughs> he wasn't writing in chapters. He just wrote the next sentence. And when you start reading the next sentences, it's clear he's not talking about Jesus coming to take people out of the world in order to prevent them from being destroyed. He's coming to destroy his enemies. And when he destroys his enemies, the dead, those who are in Christ, whether dead or alive, will go and meet the Lord in the air. They're not going to live up in the air. They're coming. They're they're meeting him there to bring him back down to earth. Uh, the way we know that is because the language that Paul uses is the language that you get in ancient texts to talk about what happens when a king comes to your city. You know, in advance he's coming. When he comes, you send out the elders of the church of the uh, of the city, the leaders of the city, the rulers of the city. They go out to meet him, and then they escort him back in. Uh, that's that that's the parousia, the coming or the presence of the king. And this is what the Christians are going to do. They're they're going to go out and welcome their king, and then bring him back to rule. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that he, they're going to be taken to heaven for seven years while all hell breaks out on earth. It's that's a later development from, as I said, from the 19th century. What can you tell us about the imminent doom or the imminent return of Jesus? Where does this start? Is it Jesus himself that promises this? And how does Paul deal with this decades later when people are dying and it doesn't look like it's coming well, Jesus himself thought that the end was going to come within his generation. He says that um, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. He told his disciples that they would that some of them would be alive when it happens. Truly, I tell you, some of you standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come in power. Uh, Jesus did not think he was coming back. Jesus was talking about this cosmic judge of the earth who was going to come and destroy his enemies and set up a kingdom here on earth. But after Jesus died, his followers thought he was that cosmic judge. And so since Jesus had said that he's coming soon, they thought, well, Jesus is coming soon. Um, the thought developed fairly quickly that Jesus first was going to allow time for the gospel to be spread throughout the world so that more people would would be saved and um that time and so paul thought paul thought he'd be alive that you know he's spreading the gospel that's why that's why paul is so eager to spread the gospel because this has to happen before the end occurs and so paul's out there really trying to convert people throughout the world uh and because he thinks he'll be alive when it happens but then toward the end of his life he seems to start doubting it he thinks he might be martyred first. Well, every generation has thought, you know, Jesus said it's soon, so it's going to be soon. <laughs> and now 2,000 years later, people are saying, yeah, well, so it's going to be soon, right? <laughs> but, uh, and of course, people have these excuses, not excuses, but they, they, they turn to the Bible. And the Bible says that, um, you know, God's time isn't like our time. The, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And so when people tell me that, and I say, yeah, you know, that's absolutely right. So if, you, if you're pretty sure that Jesus is coming back in three days, uh, then you can start looking for him in the year 5,023. <laughs> well, that's how they rationalize around that. Because, I mean, yeah. the, so you mentioned that Jesus himself in the text is saying that some of you won't taste death, taste death before I return. Paul seems to... Not before I return. He doesn't think he's returning. Paul, Jesus For, is talking about a cosmic judge of the earth, not not himself. Right. Okay. There, that's important. 
So there's so it starts off with that. And then Paul sort of takes this idea and says, well, some of you are asleep. What's this idea of sleep? What is it? What's going on with that? Sleep in the New Testament is a euphemism for dying. Um, and so we have our euphemisms. We Somebody dies and you don't want to be too uh, crass about it. So you'll say something like, well, they passed, you know, or they passed away. Or if you want to be crass, you say, you know, they kicked the bucket. <laughs> you, know, you, you come up with some alternative way of saying it. And um, the and in in the New Testament, the euphemism for, for death is sleep. And the, it's because in the New Testament, people thought, the, the followers of Jesus thought that when you died, you're not permanently dead. God's going to bring you back. And so you have a period of sleep before you come back. But it means you're dead. Interesting. Okay. So the reason why I asked that is to set up this. There's this idea in Revelation 12 of a woman who's going to give birth to a male child who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. Is this playing off this coming of a second coming? What, what's the, what does this mean? This is a reference, actually, it's, as you know, I mean, the book of Revelation is filled with symbolism. And one of the tricks to interpreting the book is to understand the symbolism. And because it's symbolism, people go every which way in order to come up with interpretations. Um, a lot of the symbolism is not that hard to understand if you actually understand John's historical context. And so um, when what historical scholars do is they work out what's going on in that historical context that helps you make sense of this symbolism. And so in my, in my book, on, in the book Armageddon, I show how this works. I don't deal directly with this passage very much, but when, when, it, when you read the passage very carefully, it's quite clear that the woman who's giving birth to, um, to, to this one and that the dragon start looking for and trying to kill the dragon in the, new, in the book of Revelation is the devil. And uh, the one who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Some some interpreters think that this is Jesus, and that it's uh, that Israel, the woman, is um, gives birth to Jesus. Uh, some people think that it's referring to the church, that Israel gives birth to the church, and it's sent off into the wilderness to be persecuted by the devil. So it's the persecution of the church. Um, yeah. So. And so there, this idea that there's going to be a period of time wherein she will have to like flee from this dragon, mm -hmm. Satan. Um, and then there's this text later on about a thousand year being chained for a thousand years. What's the history of this? And how did, because uh, uh, like, like I mentioned before, the Pope Sylvester II in the year 1000 thought that this was going to be a real thing happening, which obviously didn't happen. How does this get reinterpreted over time? And what do people say today about this passage? About um, about the millennium, yeah. So so um, I have a good long discussion about the millennium uh, in, in my book. The when John talks about it uh, in the in John of Patmos in the book of Revelation, he he's describing a thousand year period on Earth after the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, the uh, the enemies of God are all wiped out by Christ at this final battle, and then the Earth is given over to the martyrs of Jesus to rule with, with Jesus. So they basically, the, mar the, the ones who have been killed for their faith rule for a thousand years. Um, and so that's the thousand year millennium. And the question is, when does the millennium start? Uh, that's the millennium in Revelation happens before the final judgment. <laughs> After the millennium, everybody's raised from the dead, and then there's a final judgment. But so the millennium is the rule of earth just with the martyrs and Jesus. Um, but the question was, well, when does that happen? And throughout most of history, uh, for for most of the first 1900 years of Christianity, well, no, since since Augustine in the fifth century, uh, since Augustine, people theologians understood that the thousand year period was a metaphor for the rule of the church on earth, that it was happening now, um, and that the the church is uh, is ruling ruling. And during this millennium, John says that Satan will be bound and will not be able to do any harm. And Augustine argued that that's right. People who are in Christ cannot be harmed by the devil. And so this was the interpretation for basically throughout most of history until the 1830s. So, but that's interesting because that, that makes sense for Augustine to think that, but th that also makes sense for Pope Sylvester II in the year 1000 
to say, oh my God, it's about to be over. It's almost, it's been a thousand years since Christ. We have like 30 years left. So how do people deal with that after it comes? It doesn't, so they, do they reinterpret it after that? Like you mentioned how it's still in the year 1800, they still think this way, but that's, that's almost 2000 years now. Like what's going on with the thousand? You know, that's what I'm trying to get at. There was a book written some years ago that argued that this whole Sylvester Thousand thing wasn't a big deal. <laughs> that is on the margins. And um, there, but there definitely were people who thought it was going to end possibly then. Yeah. The big date actually was the year 1260. <laughs> you would have thought. <laughs> but the year 1260 was chosen as the year it was going to end. And then, but Different people have picked different years. Of course, 1848 was a very big year. 1980 it was supposed to be a big, big year. And so when I say that this was the interpretation of most theologians, when I say most theologians, I don't mean every every Bible reader. There were people who thought, uh, oh, it's predicting now. But the vast majority of people at the time um, thought that the millennium is not a future event that's going to happen. It's something that's happening now in the church. And the thing that's going to happen is that uh, that Christ is going to come back at some point and destroy his enemies, and that'll be that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, they developed the idea. What happens in the 1830s that I've mentioned is the idea that there could be, there's something that was called pre-millennialism, which is that Christ comes back before the millennium um, rather than he comes back after the millennium. In St. Augustine's view, if this is the millennium, when Christ comes back, it's the millennium's over. Uh, but this view started developing that he's coming back before the millennium uh, in judgment. And so that became a pre-millennial view, which is the view that most fundamentalists have today. You mentioned 1260. This is a time period where um, you know the Mongols are, this is the 13th century, the Mongols are huge. You have the Holy Roman Empire I think, if I'm not mistaken, the church is after the Crusades and the church is started saying, all right, maybe the Islam is just going to keep Jerusalem now. Why is this year so important for the end of the time? Is there a mathematical thing happening or is it because of the events happening? Um, it's hard to tell how much the events were affecting the thinking. The thinking was actually started by one person, Joachim of Fiori, um, whom, I, whom I discuss in the book, who... Um, who came to think it, it, it wasn't connected with Jerusalem or the Mongols or <laughs> Muslims or anything like that. It had to do with his own theological view, which was that he believed in the Trinity. And he thought that since God created the world, that the world was organized uh, in three periods, that the Trinity was written into the history of earth. And so the periods are the father and the period of the son and the period of the spirit. The period of the father was all of time up to from from Abraham when God chose Abraham to be his his the the leader of the future people from the time of Abraham the father of the Jews up to Jesus was the period of the father uh, and according to the Gospel of Matthew the uh, period of the father uh, and you know in Matthew Matthew has this thing where uh, there are generations between Abraham and David and David in the Babylonian captivity and the Babylonian captivity in Jesus and each of these is separated by 14 generations and so if you count up the 14 generations it's uh, 42 uh, 42 generations and uh, Joachim thought that each generation was 30 years and so the first the period between God and Jesus was 1260 years well if that's the period of the father how long is the period of the sun going to be? Probably 1260 years. And so if followers of Joachim of Fiori worked out that, that the period of Christ then will be, uh, will end in 1260. Well, the last thing I want to ask you is that, so now that these dates have come and gone, what do you think is, is pushing people to keep every, every two years is another date now. Like there's another one coming in like six months from now. What is your last thoughts on this? And, that's yeah. the last thing I want to ask you about. It's a really interesting phenomenon. And um, so in my, you know, in the lecture on the rapture, I'm going to be talking about a lot of this and, and explain where it came from and how it, what it has to do with anything and, and why people are still expecting it. I mean, you know, m many millions of people, the, the, um, this novel series left behind by Timothy LaHaye and Philip Jenkins uh, argued that, um, you know, it was all predicated on that Jesus is coming and you don't want to be left here afterwards. Um, this is uh, based on this modern thinking of the rapture happening. 
Uh, I have a lengthier discussion of it in my book, uh, Armageddon, but it's a very good question. Why do people keep hanging on to it? And, you know, because every time somebody picks a date, it's wrong, <laughs> incontrovertibly wrong. And it one reason, <laughs> well, sometimes it backfires. And, and, you know, sometimes when it backfires, people become even more insistent. They reset the date. They become more insistent. It's really going to happen this time. So I deal with all of that in my book on, on uh, Armageddon. But, uh, but the, the question is what you're asking is why, you know, why do you keep doing that? And, and the reason is, I think, because people, um, people think that life has to be better than this. Uh, there's going to be a better world. And the suffering happening in the world now can't possibly get much worse. I mean, look around. Of course, people have always said that. <laughs> and so how bad can it be? And now, you know, with the invasion of uh, of Ukraine, oh, my God, you know, it's going to lead to World War Three. And you got this whole thing in Israel going on and things are going to. Gog and Magog, Gog and Magog. Yeah. Gog and Magog. And, you yeah. know, Magog is Moscow, Ma Moscow, Magog. And so um, and so the so every generation thinks it's going to be the last generation. And what I'll tell you, one of the things I do in my book that I'll probably do in my lecture, too, is to point out that this has very bad. This has very bad effects on society. Thank you. Because if you think that the end's going to come next week, you're not really that concerned about eliminating poverty in the world. Climate and change. Climate change. Who cares about climate change? There's not going to be a, you know, I mean, God's going to take care of it. He created it. He'll take care of it. It's going to be sometime next Thursday. <laughs> you know, and so I think that um, I don't think it's a good good uh, view to have but more than that i think you can show that it's not what the bible teaches and my lecture i'm going to be trying to show this is not what the bible teaches this is a foreign idea that's imposed on the bible by people who are taught this idea and then when they read the bible they see it there because they've been told it's there it's not there and i'm going to as a former believer in the rapture i'm going to try and show that yeah it's not there yes yes we will i just got off a cold myself so i'm okay. I feel for you. And uh, I just purchased a webinar that is next week hosted by yours truly. So tell anybody in my audience who hasn't heard about it yet how they can get there. Well, so if they just go to bartderman.com slash Christmas, or I suppose you'll probably be posting a link maybe. I it's this is this is going to be a lot of fun. So it's going to be uh, on Sunday, December 5th. It's going to be an all-day webinar. Uh, I'm giving four lectures. My voice will be better by then. I'm going to give four lectures back to back, lunch break, back to back. And people will be able to ask questions. I'll answer the question as many questions as I get. And the entire webinar is going to be on the topic. Did the Christmas story really happen? <laughs> and so what do you know? What do we know about, you know, the birth of Jesus? If anything, we got legends, you got history is what can you tell really happened? You got these stories in the New Testament. You got stories outside the New Testament. Are any of them plausible? How do we know the whole the whole shebang? And so it'll be a full day thing. And so people are welcome to come. I hope they can come because it'll be it's a nice time of the year to talk about this kind of thing. And it is the season. So perfect timing. <laughs> And uh, so this book right here, it's one of my favorites, and it's uh, it's one that you wrote how long? Like a couple long time ago. Long time ago. Okay, so my youth. <laughs> so I want to ask you about the. Uh, first of all, let's start with this. Let's do a true or false. You can just tell me true or false, and then you can elaborate. Okay. So is this true or false that Christians now, with all these sects and denominations, you got Mormons, you got Catholics, you got evangelicals. They disagree on so much stuff that they probably disagree more than the Christians in the original second century would. would the, the, the Christians in the second and first century must have agreed on everything because they're right, right off the time Jesus was alive, right? True or false? Uh, false. <laughs> so that's it's what I used to think, <laughs> but you act. All you have to do is read the early sources of Christianity. And you see, oh, my goodness. This, oh, my. It's like it's crazily diverse. Um, in the second century, you've got church fathers who are attacking Christian groups, groups that claim to be Christian, claim to be followers of Jesus, claim they have support in biblical writings for their views that there are two different gods. It's not just like the gods different in the Old Testament, New Testament. There are literally two different gods. Some say there are 12 gods. There are Christians who say they're followers of Jesus who say there are 36 gods. We know one group that says there are 365 gods. <laughs> they're wow. Christian. And so they're, they're, I mean, the views are just so far all over the map. 
you and you know you would think well that might, that's got to be like you know after a few hundred years things split off no right off the bat in this in the second century we would definitely have that and one of the interesting questions of scholarship is how early does the diversity go what's really interesting that most people haven't noticed is that when paul writes his letters in the new testament Virtually every letter, he's attacking other Christians who have false views that completely disagree with his. Ha! Right. <laughs> yeah, we don't have their writings. <laughs> that would be. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so let's talk about these groups now. They've got the Marcionites, right, on one side, and they are they don't like the Old Testament God. That's you know they think that's a demiurge. The, I don't know if you call them Gnostics or not. And then on the other side, you've got the Ebionites who are followers of the Torah, the pretty much the exact opposite. They, yeah. they love the, the old Testament. They follow the laws. They do kosher. They do, yeah. they do all the, yeah. all that stuff. And then you got what I guess you would call the proto Orthodox ones who are kind of in a different camp. Yeah. Can you kind yeah. of elaborate on what the differences are with those? Yeah. So, uh, no, you got it right there. So the Marcionites are followers of a man named Marcion, who was a teacher theologian who said, look, you know, the God of the Old Testament really is not the God of the New Testament. I mean, just look at it. In the Old Testament, God God tells his people to go into the city of Jericho and destroy it. They march around the city once a, time, once a day for six days, and the seventh day, walk around seven times, blow the trumpets, the walls fall down, and then God tells them, go in there and slaughter every man, woman, and child and animal in the city. Is that the same God who says, love your neighbor? Like <laughs> pray for those who persecute you no that's a different god right and so Marcin really thought there were two there were two gods the god of the old testament created this world which is why it's such a mess and the god of jesus tried to it came to save people from that god so the god of jesus is not the creator not the god of the old testament it's a different god so he thought that and then you've got people on the other side of the fence who are who are Jews, they're raised Jewish or they became Jewish, who say, no, the God of the Old Testament is the Christian God. And in fact, Jesus is the son of that God. And Jesus did not cancel the Old Testament. When God said, don't eat pork, he means you're not supposed to eat pork. He didn't change his mind. <laughs> and so if you're going to be a follower of the Jewish Messiah from the Jewish God to the Jewish people to fulfill the Jewish law, you got to be Jewish. And so one is like completely opposed to Judaism. The other is embracing Judaism. They're both claiming to be followers of Jesus. And that doesn't bring into account all of the Gnostic groups that are really bizarre by modern thinking, uh, right. that are really, uh, impossible to explain in you know one minute. Right. But, so yeah, you get all of these diverse groups going on. And so with Marcion, you got an interesting story with him. He goes to Rome, and he's trying to sell his version of Christianity there, and it so, sort of fails. What happens with that? So um, Marcion was, the, the traditional dating is that Marcion was in the middle of the second century and that he, he's from the north, north central Turkey um, on the shore of the Black Sea. And he ended up uh, developing his own theological system that I was just explaining a little bit of. Right. And he decided to go to Rome in the year 139. And he spent about five years in Rome uh, developing a system and writing books. And then he presented his views to the Roman hierarchy of the church, the, the Roman, the leaders of the Roman church, hoping that they would accept his perspective as being the authoritative view. But instead, they rejected it and kicked him out of the church. <laughs> right. so, so then he went around Asia Minor and he started starting his own churches and he was very, very successful. There were there were areas in what's now Turkey that were predominantly Marcionite. This was the kind of Christianity they had. Um, and I would say that a lot of Christians today are still Marcionite. You know, a lot of Christians say, yeah, we don't work, we don't follow the Old Testament. You know, or we, we don't keep the Old Testament God. You know, he, he's the God of wrath. We follow God of love. Well, okay, but I mean, that's Marcionite. <laughs> that's a good point. And, and it's, they don't even realize they're doing that. They just kind of are. I, no, you, see, you see, even, even evangelicals will <laughs> talk about how, you know, the law kept people in bondage. And the New yeah. Testament, now we, we're, we're free from that law. It's, we're circumcising the heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need the Torah. And yeah. like, that's sort of Marcionite in a little bit of a way, yeah. right? Well, you know, the other way Christians are Marcionite today is that Marcions said that since the creator who made this world, the material world, was not the true God, not the God of Jesus, Jesus could not belong to the creator God, which means Jesus couldn't have a material body. Jesus was God. He wasn't, he, he seemed like a human, but it was just an appearance. And today, if I ask my students, 
You know, they'd say, yeah, well, Jesus was God. Well, was he really a human? Well, he's kind of a human, but they don't really think he was a human being. And so uh, that's Marcy and I. Yeah, you get, you get one of these like things that defy mathematics when you say he's 100% God and 100% man. It's like, how can you be 100% of any two things? Yeah, right. And how can you have a trinity where the three are all equally God? They're all they're different persons. All three of them, they're equally God, and there's only one God. Well, that, right. this is how Christian theology developed, and it, it's it's interesting in its way because it's very paradoxical, and to that extent, it's actually quite sophisticated. But it, yeah, it doesn't make mathematical sense. <laughs> yeah, and so it's funny because you hear about different denominations today, and you, you look at Mormons compared to Catholics or evangelicals compared to orthodox greek whatever yeah. and you think they're so far apart yeah if you compare them to the marcionites and the ebionites they're actually closer together because they yeah. at least agree on who jesus was which yeah. is a big deal they agree on who jesus there, there are all sorts of things they have in common that are different from these most of these ancient groups i mean you know greek orthodox and mormons when they talk about the new testament they've got the same 27 books in their new testaments i mean you know and, and marcin didn't marcin had a canon of only 11 books he didn't have any old testament he had some gospels kind of like our it was like our luke and he had 10 of paul's letters that was it so you know very very different okay so the let's get into the gnostics a little bit because i am i am the gnostic informant so we should talk about yeah, that. You talk about is that, that is that really is, were, were, were people calling themselves Gnostics, or is this a later term that we used to, to defi define groups? Was that really a thing or no? The term Gnostic was used. Uh, we don't know that Gnostic groups used it of themselves. Their opponents used it of Gnostics. And okay. there actually were proto-Orthodox Christians like Clement of Alexandria, who considered himself a Gnostic. Because the word Gnostic simply means somebody who knows. To know. Greek word gnosis, which means no, to know, to know. And so Gnostics were, there are ver various groups of Gnostics. The, the differences among them, just like the Greek Orthodox versus the Mormons, I mean, they're very different. But they did agree that knowledge was the way of salvation and that it's not Christ's death that brings about salvation. It's the secret knowledge that he revealed. And he revealed how people can understand uh, the, the world and reality and who they really are so that they can escape the material trappings of this world to 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 return to the spiritual home they came from yeah and you can see in the writings of paul why this is um considered her heretical because paul talks about knowledge being insufficient and that even he even gets into being works being insufficient it's all about faith and then you write and then you go a couple couple books later you get to james and james is like well it's about it's about works you, yeah uh, he's, he calls him like a you idiot or something he says something like that. And then you could kind of tell, I think, if, and correct me for what you think if you disagree or not. I think he's talking to Paul. It looks like he's talking to Paul. I have a thought. I, I thought that for a long time. I actually have a different view of that now, which is close, a close view to that. I think that actually, I don't think James and Paul are disagreeing. I think what's going on is that James is disagreeing with later Christians who took Paul's teachings to an extreme. Okay. What Paul taught was that a person cannot be made right with God by doing the works of the law. By that he meant you can't become right with God by being, becoming Jewish. Becoming Jewish ain't going to get you there. So the works of the law for Paul means like things like getting circumcised and keeping kosher and observing the Sabbath. Doing that stuff's not going to put you in the right relation. You've got to have faith with Christ. So he had this thing about works of the law. But later Paul and Christians said you can't be right with God by doing works. And they appear to me like doing good things. And you find that already in the New Testament. The book of Ephesians claims to be written by Paul. It almost certainly was not written by Paul. The guy who wrote Ephesians thought that, that you can't be saved by doing good things. James is attacking that. Right. That makes sense. That's a, that's a good way to look yeah. at it. So it's a Pauline form of Christianity, but I don't think it's exactly how Paul would have put it. Yeah. And uh, I mean, so I, I it seems to me that Christianity is sort of like a, like you sort of get handed down these concepts from like the Gnosis. Pythagoras wrote about the Gnosis. I think Plato did too. Concept like the Logos that Philo was talking about. Yeah. And um, it seems like the uh, the back and forth in the in the epistles that pe pe people call contradictions. I used to think that it was one of my like, oh, look, the Bible contradicts itself. But now I'm sort of seeing it's more like a platonic, not a dialogue, but like a 
like here's different situations and here's uh-huh. how you handle these situations. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. Sort, it's sort of it's that's how it's put put together. On yeah. Purpose. Well, I think it's a helpful way to look at it. I mean, I do think you know there are obvious contradictions. I think, in my opinion, but but a lot of it is kind of dialogical, um, and but the dialogical aspect of it shows that um, people have different perspectives, and they're trying to they're trying to feed off of different perspectives and trying to provide more nuance, and they're trying to, and so it isn't it isn't kind of a black and white thing that you know. Uh, this author says this, and then this author completely contradicts. Sometimes it happens, especially in narratives, especially like in the Gospels, you know, where you, you've got two accounts of Jesus doing something. You just can't reconcile them no matter how much you try. But um, uh, but a lot of times you're, it's it's what you're saying. They're playing off of each other. Yeah. So I got one minute left. So I'm going to say in conclusion, I think it's safe to say that I think Christians today should sort of take for granted I take for granted the fact that to be a Christian you have to believe X, Y, and Z about Jesus. You have to believe that he died, that he resurrected, that he was that he's God, whatever. But back in the, the earlier before the church became the uh state religion, you didn't have to there wasn't no you didn't have to believe anything. You just you just you b- belong to a certain group and that's the way it was. Yeah the way I guess I would put that is before you start getting these creeds develop in the fourth century you have different groups that had different beliefs and there was no, there was no standard. Um, but of course, you know, in the fourth century, they started developing creeds like the Nicene Creed, where uh, we believe in God, the father almighty maker of heaven and earth. And, you know, like, you got to say this. Right. And so it becomes more standardized. Even when you make it standardized though, of course, people interpret it in different ways. And that's why you get the Mormons and the Greek Orthodox. <laughs> They're still very different from each other. Yeah. Uh, but- but it is it is more unified now, I think, than it was. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. And uh, thanks for thanks for uh, coming on. And everybody, right. the links in the description for the webinar, and go check that out. And you have just attained true gnosis.